Welcome to the 28th meeting in 2014 of the Finance Committee of the Scottish Parliament. Could I please remind everyone present to turn off any mobile phones or other electronic devices. Our first item of business today is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's draft budget 2015-16 from Philip Hogg, the Chief Executive, Homes for Scotland, uh, John Hamilton, Chairman of the Scottish Property Federation, Ian Honeyman, Commercial Director of the Scottish Property Federation, and David Stewart, Policy Manager, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. So welcome to you all this morning. Uh, members have received papers from each of our witnesses, so we'll go straight to two questions. And uh, what a uh, normal situation is, as I'm sure you can uh, imagine, is that um, I will start with a few opening questions and then I'll open out the session to colleagues uh, around the table. Uh, first thing I want to say is that I was very impressed by the quality of the submissions that you actually presented to this morning. Actually, they really were quite excellent. Now, I'm going to ask some of the questions myself and colleagues might ask will actually, to some extent, possibly be answered in the papers. But obviously, for the, the committee record, I think it's important that we actually uh, go through some of these in, in some greater detail. So it's a question, really, of which one uh, to start at, I suppose, because there are so many questions to ask. Um, <clears throat> so let's just start with the Scottish Property Federation's uh, submission first. When I ask a question, though, of one individual, please, um, if, you, if you wish to comment, um, other than to the person I'm asking the question to, please uh, uh, feel free to do so. We want to get as wide a range of uh, responses as possible. And the Scottish Property Federation, you talk about the approach to LBTT uh, and suggest it would be more prudent to, uh, to have allowed Scottish ministers greater freedom to set competitive tax rates and thresholds. So I'm just wondering if you can go... Uh, through uh, briefly your thinking uh, on that, and I'm not sure whether uh, Mr. Hamilton or indeed um, uh, um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Honeyman would wish to answer that question. Well, uh, I'm happy to uh, answer on behalf of the SPF. Um, the SPF firstly does see and welcomes the change to a progressive slab system. We think that's an excellent uh, introduction. Uh, which we see as being of benefit to both the, the residential and the, the commercial markets. Um, we also see, you know, there's a position which we think the Scottish Government can now take in looking at an advantageous position in terms of uh, the ability for developers to trade within the, the UK. And we think that the bans and rates that have been introduced at the moment uh, would merit some adjustment in order uh, to give Scotland the sort of ad advantageous trading position that we think this might introduce. Now, before I, I go on, I'd like to apologise to Mr Honeyman. I'm afraid my briefing you're listed as being from the Scottish Property Federation, but you are, in fact, from the Scottish Building Federation, so... Uh, just want to make that clear. Um, <clears throat> okay, now, now the issue, of course, is that um, what, what impact would these changes have that you may suggest have on revenue? Because one of the things about LBTT, as well as the progressive nature, is that the, the, the Scottish Government's view is that they want to keep it broadly revenue neutral. So, mm -hmm. how would your um, how would your suggestions actually in, ensure that we continued to have that revenue neutrality? Because we don't necessarily want to raise more taxes, it's just the distribution of taxes that's raised through this legislation. That's yes, we, we also, we, we do agree that, uh, you know, the position of neutrality is one that uh, we, we accept. Um, the base information, you know, perhaps could be reconsidered in the first year or two of the introduction. It's difficult to predict um, exactly you know, how the markets would respond to this kind of change. It is quite a major change, you know, to see Scotland uh, introduce a new tax system. So there will be quite a lot of sensitivity in it. Um, you know, we see it as being an issue which it's not going to be necessarily understood in the first year or two of its introduction exactly how it will impact in the market. Um, over a short period, though, you know, depending on the quality of the data that's used to, uh, you know, ma make market assessment, we think that position of neutrality could still be achieved and still, you know, allow some competition 
within Scotland about attract investment to, to the industry. And you've uh, suggested in actual fact that uh, a new banding effectively is created, you know, yes. which uh, would have a kind of softer um, move, if you like, from the 2% to the 10%. Mm -hmm. I just wonder what kind of impact you, you, you think that might have in terms of the wider property market. Well, we think that the change in bands is too severe. You know, it's uh, possibly going to lead to some um, distortion in the market where people may make decisions on whether or not they proceed with a, a transaction. Um, you know, this is, you know, both in terms of the residential and the, the commercial market. And with that, you know, quite severe change in the bans and in the rates, we don't see that as being, you know, adding a sort of positive aspect to investment decisions that would be made in Scotland, you know, compared to the, the rest of the UK. Okay, thank you. Do, do any of the other colleagues uh, on the panel wish to comment on what uh, Mr Hanlon said? Mr Hogg? Uh, <clears throat> yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, endorse what John has said, that we broadly welcome the new the model, the new system, um, removing the steps, the slabs, which did create distortion. So for that, we, we, we're very supportive. Um, and I think generally our, our comments in the paper today and, and what I'd like to discuss here are, are suggesting how it could be tweaked rather than wholesale engineering. But, but to pick up on, on, on John's point, whilst we acknowledge and welcome the fact that purchasers below, I think, 325,000 are likely to pay uh, either the same or less, the, the, the net effect of that is that the tax burden on those purchasing above 325,000 has to be considerably more. And whilst you know the, the, there will be little sympathy, I suspect, for people purchasing you know in the very high hundreds of thousands, that we, we believe that there's a critical uh, price point between 325 to around about 500,000 where the tax increase will be in the region of about extra uh, maybe 40 odd percent. A significant increase. Now, again, the, the, there may be there may be a little sympathy for purchase in that area, but what we need to look at is not so much the emotions of it, but what it might do to the marketplace. And to have a an effective system, we need to have price movement. We need to have movement through the market, through all stages of the market, because we need people to move upwards to vacate properties at the entry level to allow first time buyers through there. So if we create stagnation or, or lack of movement at any, at any point in the marketplace, it could have the effect of stifling movement at the, at the lower levels. So that, that's our concern and why we also suggested that a new band was inserted um, between 250 and 500,000 to, to, to uh, relieve the tax burden a little bit. We're still suggesting it would be more, but not as more, if, if, if you like. Um, <clears throat> Now, the, the consequence of, of, or the risk of that not happening is that we understand that the majority of, of the tax, um, it will fall on the 10% of the very high number of purchases. And we think that there is a risk there that the, if those purchases simply decide not to move because the, uh, the, uh, the, the tax is too high, then there could potentially be a risk that the forecast, forecast tax intake could be less than, uh, than may be considered. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, I think what we have to uh, note is that uh, as a result of the financial crisis and the housing market collapse, um, many people are, are, are sitting in properties that are probably worth a lot less than they were many years ago. So their equity in those properties is a lot less than it would have been many years ago. And whereas traditionally people would have moved up the, up the housing ladder and had equity that would have been used to have paid off the stamp duty, there's less of that around. So there's, it's less affordable to move upwards. And as I say, that we believe could create that stagnation in that section of the market and ultimately impact on tax take and overall movement in the market. Talking about 5% about though of the overall housing market being uh, disadvantaged, we're not given that the kind of, um, the, anyone who buys a house under £324,300 likes to be better off in terms of mm -hmm. the amount of tax. Um, is one of the issues you have in terms of the geography 
Um, you know, obviously some areas of Scotland are, are poorer than others, and so therefore there's quite a differential in terms of the number of properties in specific areas. Is, it, is that a concern? You know, so for the areas that are more prosperous, this might be more impactful than other areas? I, I, um, I think there's an element of that, but I think it's also not necessarily more prosperous. It's just the sheer cost of housing in some, in some localities is is just just more expensive that's just one of those facts that certain geographies have more expensive properties um and what we the, the most prosperous parts of scotland have got the most expensive houses clearly east renfrewshire aberdeenshire uh, east lothian uh, edinburgh i mean where i am in ayrshire there's not really many houses that sell for more three hundred twenty four thousand pounds to be honest um, so what we're, what we're proposing is for is for a more even spread of the tax take through the bands, um, rather than a very steep increase when it goes across that neutral point. We're just asking for it to be evened out. We still support, and in our proposal, we still support that the people at the lower ends are giving a tax advantage. In other words, they pay less. But we think it could be more evened out rather than as steep as it as it maybe is at the moment. Indeed. If, however, the tax the, the, the kind of 10% tax of a quarter of a million pounds uh, to, to one million pounds does actually have the impact of reducing house prices in overheated areas such as Edinburgh, Aberdeen, etc. Would that not perhaps be perceived by some people as being a good thing? I think that we have to be careful about what we think about reducing house prices because our experience has shown <clears throat> through our members is that uh, homeowners have a belief of what their property is worth and some of them or many of them when they come to consider selling or consider moving if they find out that the property is worth or worth less than they had thought mm -hmm. will result in them simply not moving um, or having a higher expectation of what of what they think they should and that creates this stagnation that we thought we're, our members have, uh, have have noted that and reported that back over uh, significantly over the last few years, particularly when they're considering offering part exchange for home movers, uh, when the home mover is told how much their property is worth, they you know they simply say, no, that can't be true. I paid X, or I've heard that properties are moving up, and um, the, the, that acceptance is difficult pill to swallow for many. And as I say, if if they accept that their property is worth less, then that will impinge on their existing equity and therefore their ability to pay that tax. And it should be pointed out that the average price of a detached house in Edinburgh in August 2014 was 200, under £242,000. So I'll just add that in for perspective now. Point to that, you know, mm. I think the Scottish Property Federation would see it would be more benefit to add, you know, stimulus to the lower end of the market and improve the quality of housing in uh, the market rather than to impose you know, the most severe rates of tax on the, the higher end of the market, which, you know, looks at the problem from the from another angle, basically. Thank you for that. Uh, Mr Honeyman, I mean, in your, your submission, actually, um, you say that, and I quote, the, the transition to a progressive system of taxation of property transactions will undoubtedly have a positive impact on the property market and the wider economy by eliminating current distortions in the market caused by the existing mm. slab structure of STLT. And I'm just wondering if you can expand a bit on that. Well, perspective. obviously, the, the 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 existing system that's there at the moment has issues. Uh, we believe that the the transition to move across to the LBTT tax is going to actually benefit probably more than it disadvantages. There are there are, as I think you've pointed out, issues in, in terms of geographical things where the, the perception of this particular tax is going to be different, um, and I don't think you're going to change that just because. We are where we are geographically, um, but one of, one of the issues and such like that the, uh, the the tax and such like will address is we, we believe it will promote the, um, the the growth at the bottom end of the market and probably a more affordable housing, uh, which is obviously we're all crying out for us to get the, the housing market moving again, um, and we believe that 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 particular issue is addressed by that by the tax. Um, there are there are issues. That with regard to this step between the 2 to the 10%. Um, and in, 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 in essence, the, the concern we have overall thing is if the tax is to be neutral overall, it's, it's making it relatively fair across, across the board. I think that's the, it has to be seen to be fair. 
if it if it disadvantages things, um, and, and as I say, the market around about the 325,000 has been flagged up as the as sort of line in the sand. There's an issue there that that £325,000 mark, people may decide that they're not going to move, that they would rather stay where they are and invest. And that become, can be quite good for the construction industry generally, but it's not going to help the, the housing market. People's aspirations to move up the ladder still exists, and it's possible that that, that could be an area that does uh, sort of create a, create a problem in the market, but not everywhere. I think you've pointed out the majority of houses are probably in the lower bands that are going to be better off from that and that's probably that's the thing that's going to stimulate it the, the areas of more affluent uh, scotland i think they would feel that they're prepared to pay extra money but as long as it's not seen to be sort of punitive on their particular issues yeah uh, thank you uh, for that I, I mean i have to say that um, uh, um, professor McEwen, our advisor has actually said that taxation at higher end uh, is not really as much a consideration for people as one might think when trying to move house, for example? I mean, to, how, how much of a consideration do you believe it actually is? I think you have to remember that people want to move up the lane, that they have to be in a position to be able to afford to, to move, not when you're already there and have the equity and everything in the property. There has to be, a, it's that transition that's this big step. Somebody making the decision to move from a £180,000 house up to a £300,000 house, if they could afford it, it's suddenly going to be a bigger step than it would otherwise have been. And that's the, that's the issue I think that may have to be looked at. 180, 300,000 still would be better off. Well, yeah, yeah, uh, yes, they would be, but when they step above that, I mean, obviously, the, the, the whole the whole market is a chain you know, to a certain extent. We believe that some of the, some of the chain would be addressed by the, the introduction of new housing. Uh, a lot of the first-time buyers are not looking for existing housing. If there's more new, new properties on the market, that's what we believe the, the stimulation to the, to the, the um, housing side of things is going to be. Okay. Thank you for that. Now, Mr. Stewart, actually, um, you've got, uh, you're broadly supportive of the, of the kind of proposals in terms of progression, so I'm not going to go into that particular area because uh, your um, submission is, uh, ha um, it focuses on other areas. I'm not going to talk about the issue of um, low-carbon homes because I'm sure other colleagues around the table would want to ask you specifically about that, and I don't want to steal the thunder, but um, I just wonder if you can talk through a wee bit about um, issues in relation to... Um, uh, housing such as mid-market rent through uh, non-charitable subsidiaries uh, and the impact the legislation may actually have on that particular area because it's a wee bit different from some of the other submissions. Yeah, yeah um, in a way, um, housing associations um, developing mid-market rent might seem quite a small consideration. It, it's not a huge part of their businesses uh, and it does tend to be focused very much in areas... Um, where the market is strong and, and where there's pressured area status, such as Edinburgh, um, Aberdeen. But um, w one point about the tax, which, as you say, we are broadly supportive of, that, that is a, a cause for possible concern, is we understand where charitable subsidiaries of housing associations provide mid-market rent, sorry, non-charitable subsidiaries, and they're um, buying multiple properties from developers. The nature of the new tax really is a result of the fact that it seeks to charge proportionately higher levels for higher value transactions. We understand would mean that in such a case, a housing association would pay more in stamp duty, uh, rather would pay more than it did under stamp duty. Uh, and this is something th that we'd like to see perhaps a, a further relief for exemption to, to avoid this being the case. Okay, um, thanks very much for that. Now, I I'm keen to let colleagues in, so I'm just going to ask um, uh, questions on what is one more area, and I'll switch back to yourself, Mr Hamilton, which is on commercial property sales. And you say in uh, paragraph 6.1 of your submission, you talk about uh, the th final top rate of LBTT is really the bellwether by which the property investment industry will set its yields for investable property in Scotland or proposed commercial development appraisals. And you do have some concerns about the 4.5% rate. So I'm wondering if you can talk us through that and also what sort of investments we're actually uh, talking about here. Yes, the, the, the main concern we have is that, you know, again, this will be seen as, a, as an added cost of investment in Scotland. Um, you know, it creates a, a differential uh, between the cost of uh, investing in development um, or developing an, an existing stock in Scotland, which 
uh, sets it apart from the, the rest of the UK. Um, investment in property, you know, generally much of the decision making is made at the margins and whilst, you know, it may not seem that a half of 1% makes a great deal of difference at the margin, you know, of decision making, it, it could make a great deal of difference. Um, you know, we're generally looking at projects such as the Haymarket development in Edinburgh, where they're multi-million pound investment projects and even at a half percent of the cost of that transaction that would be seen as having a net detriment to investing in Scotland, you know, compared to England and Wales. Thank you. Mr Honeyman, you've got some interesting comments on this as well actually. I'm um, just wondering if you can talk us through your uh, views on that particular issue. In terms of the the, the commercial obviously the, the sort of figure that um, the transition happens is around about the two million pound mark. I have to say, when you look at the actual overall figures, the, the, the half a percent, um, once it gets over that, it climbs. It's, I, I don't believe it's as, as significant as um, to make decision-making, um, you know, you know, put, put, put people off a project and such. Like I think if they're making a decision on a project that's of that level and it's the decision the tax makes the difference between profitable and non-profitable, I would find strange. But there are, there are issues in terms of the, the actual spend on a on a project. Um, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought there. So, um, the the tax the tax side of things, we, we, there's a there's a significant amount of volume and such like through the, the at around about the two million pound mark, um, and that's probably where the majority of this things that thing lies. Um, but I don't believe the um, that that there's a. So I've, I've I've lost my train of thought totally. Be able to apologise, gentlemen and ladies. That again, but I move on to to uh, Mr. Hogg, because you say in your submission, it's crucial that Scotland remains a competitive place to invest and bring forward housing development, and you also express concerns about the 0.5 percent. Say it's not helpful, um, and you you know, uh, but surely there are many factors in terms of property development. For example, you know the cost of a an acre or a hectare of land in London compared to Glasgow, for example, must be massively different. Surely this is only one relatively small factor in terms of these investment decisions, as Mr Hyman pointed out. Where do you see this as being... Um, uh, how, how important is this in terms of these, this decision-making process is what I'm really trying to grapple with here. I think really just building on the comments that, that John made a, a moment or two ago, um, <clears throat> many of the, the major UK-wide home builders operate an internal market of competition when they're looking at a range of potential development sites. Um, and each of the regional companies that build the homes have to compete internally against their peer group for, for uh, the group assets, the group, group finance. So anything that makes a site or a development site in Scotland more expensive than one maybe down south uh, will be looked at dispassionately by whoever is the group finance director or who is the decision maker to say, well, we can achieve a better return on our investment from the site in Durham compared to, for instance, say, Dundee. And, and this is where the economics do make a difference. It, it's also a fact that home building is more expensive in Scotland anyway as a starting point because of the higher uh, energy thermal standards that we have. So construction costs are already more expensive. And what, what we will be doing here is adding an extra, albeit maybe seen as a marginal cost, but it's just that little bit extra that just will make it that just more, little bit more difficult to compete in an internal market for, for funds. That's, we just thought it was appropriate to flag that up. It just makes it that little bit more difficult, that little bit less attractive. Okay, I would like to explore this further, actually, with you. But I mean, I've taken up a significant amount of time, and I do want my colleagues to have their opportunity. So, um, the next person to ask questions will be John, Deputy Convener, to be followed by Jamie. Hey, thanks, Convener. Um, I mean, the Convener already touched on uh, Mr. Stewart, the mid-market rent area, and I just was interested in that. I mean, have you done any studies as to how much rent would be affected by this, proportionately? Not as such. I mean, the issue was flagged by a, a member who operates mainly in Edinburgh and the Lothians uh, and has over 400 properties for mid-market rent. Um, 
it was raised as an area of concern. Um, it might not be so much um, that the rent would be affected. The, the rents tend to be set so that they sit somewhere between affordable or social housing rents where people who wouldn't otherwise be able to afford a house live and between what the market pays. Um, I suppose the concern would more be that it might either limit the number of units uh, an association might buy or actually around the cost of the public purse because really to de develop mid-market rent you need um, either land to be transferred at nil value or, or below market value or you need some, fo some form of grant or some mechanism such as the National Housing Trust that the, the Scottish Government promoted. So in some ways um, it wouldn't affect all mid-market rent properties and as I said mid-market rent is not the main part of housing associations business but I do think when we're in a period where a lot of people can no longer uh, afford to, to buy certainly until they're older it, it meets an important need and it was just to flag up that this might be a, co a cost that, that could affect the ability to deliver. Or that uh, the mid-market rent is about 80% of the, the yes, private market. Yes. And I mean, one of the phrases you may you say is meeting a housing need that would not be met by the market. I mean, presumably it's making it a bit more affordable for some people who would be struggling, but the reality is they would have had to pay the market rate otherwise, so they've already got a 20% advantage. I, I suppose um, you could say that they may have had to um, pay the market rate, but that, I, I suppose, ultimately could affect their ability to to go into employment or it could um, pose a greater burden on, on the benefit system, which is obviously a, a concern with um, welfare reform and, and changes to, to housing benefits. So, I mean, really, the, the aim of this type of housing, uh, yeah, is to meet a need of people who wouldn't normally be housed through social housing because there's so much pressure on it, but who would struggle to pay a market rent or, or to buy outright. OK. Um, I mean, another point you make is you say in a, a 3.33 under the en energy efficiency bit, uh, it's surprising the government did not make opportunity to incentivise energy efficiency. I mean, we spent quite a lot of time on this when the actual act or bill was looked at, which you may have seen. And I think the feeling then was very much that really it, wasn't, it wouldn't make a big difference to where people were buying. And also it's, it's an inefficient way of doing it because if you don't sell, you have no incentive to improve your house. So it might be better. Would you not think it would be better to do it by grants, or do you feel the tax is still better? I, I, I think in an ideal world, um, it would be better to, to do it by grants. I, I suppose what we are conscious of is um, that um, Scotland has very challenging climate change targets for carbon reduction, uh, that's got commitments in fuel poverty, uh, and we fully support um, these targets. Uh, I suppose our view would be that um, in order to meet these challenging targets and to, to deal with the fact that fuel prices continue to rise, um, really every opportunity, uh, every tool available should be used to provide a push or to incentivise energy efficiency. So, I mean, we've tried to make it clear in our submission that we don't think on its own using the, the tax would lead fully to greater awareness of energy efficiency and, and greater investment. What we feel is that along with a range of other measures, such as the minimum standards that the Scottish Government plan to consult on, such as available funds like the Home Energy Efficiency Programme, it would provide a push in that direction. So we just feel that given the importance of the issue and given the Scottish Government's commitment to it, really every opportunity should be taken. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks. I mean, if anybody else wants to come in on these, but that was specifically I was aiming at Mr Stewart. Thanks. That's fine. Uh, I mean, moving on to the, uh, the Scottish Building Federation, Mr Honeyman, uh, I, I was interested on, I think it's the third page, um, it, it talks about the respondents and how they, they saw the tax burden in the kind of bold part, and uh, it talks about 50% uh, of residents said the tax burden should say the same, 44 of respondents, sorry, 44% um, thought it should be uh, lower, so that's 94% either thought the tax should be the same or lower, 
And then on the non-residential ones, it was a 63 plus 32, which is 95% think it should be the same or lower. I mean, is that just basically saying we think there should be no tax or very little tax and that's just the whole me I think, I think it's thrust? It's probably reflective on the fact that our membership covers a wide um, range of, of um, operators effectively on both housing and commercial some of them, some of them operate on a, a, a at um, you know one-off houses and such like, but they all basically want the tax to be, if it would like to be taxed to be nil. <laughs> but generally, the, the, they are they are in favour of it being um, either staying as it was or being less. Nobody wants to pay pay more tax if they can avoid. Taking into account the fact that we need to pay the teachers and we need to pay the nurses, or is that not really a factor be, for them? Well, it's difficult to say. The questions and such that they get answered, I mean, they probably look at it from the point of view of where it affects their business as opposed to anything else, uh, rather than looking at it as a as where all this tax goes, because because effectively all tax goes into the pot. Nobody actually knows where it where it gets spent. If it's going to get spent round the. So, so when you say nobody knows where it gets spent. Well, no, what, sorry, what I'm saying the, the tax that's recovered from the, from property people pay, pay the taxes and such like on it and it goes into the, the government pot and how, uh -huh. how that money is spent is, is well we do know how the government pot is spent yeah. I guess but you, it's not ring fenced if, if that's what they mean or well yeah it's not it's, all the money it's raised from this isn't necessarily going back into construction for example no, uh, no. but it would be going into public service public service yeah, yeah, yeah appreciate that okay that's great thanks um, property federation uh, Mr Hamilton a uh, a uh, uh, talk about um the, the kind of the treasury and the block grant. I was interested in your comments on that. Uh, you said, in the absence of any apparent treasury demand on the block grant reduction, we do not understand why the finance secretary did not opt for this approach, i.e., uh, aiming for project projecting lower revenue. I think. Um, I mean, can you explain what you mean by that? Because we, we're having problems with the block grant, and as far as we understand, the treasury is pushing. Uh, to reduce the block grant more severely. Yeah, I, I think you know the point we possibly touched on it earlier. The, the amount of the reduction in the block grant is not yet known because we don't yet know how much of a stimulus or otherwise this change will make to the housing market and the commercial uh, development market. Um, the amount of tax it's taken, it's one thing to set a rate of tax and assume that the amount of revenue that you're going to tax is going to be constant. Um, it won't be. You know, it'll change, partly as a result of the change in the tax regime and partly as a result of market conditions, which nobody can absolutely predict. So, again, we, we see it as being you know, an area where we have to be cautious for the first year or two of how this is introduced until we fully understand what its impact on the market might be and consequently how there may be an impact on adjustment to the to the block grant. But there will be other reasons for, for that happening. Yes. I mean, you made the point there that, you know, that uh, the amount of tax obviously is based on transactions and house prices and uh, that is affected both by the market and by the tax. I mean, I don't know if you've done any studies, but I mean, how would you compare the two of these? I mean, I would have thought that the market would have the huge impact, either going up or down or whatever, and the tax would actually have very little impact. But w would you agree with that or would you not? No, we, we don't agree with that. You know, we, I think, you know, we, we're quite concerned about the issue that, you know, the industry can carry the added tax and it's only half of a percent. You know, as I said before, this is an added cost of investment. You know, it's an added cost of doing doing business. Uh, that won't be welcome by investors. Do people do business in London because the cost is quite high there? Yes, but the reason they do business in London is because it's seen as an attractive place to do business. You know, the values in Scotland aren't the size they are in London. But, but if we could, so if we can make Scotland an attractive place uh -huh. in other ways, as London is, you know, higher, yeah. better educated workforce, yeah. because we're paying more, for, putting more into the schools and the universities and things. I mean, then we can counter some of these things, can't yeah, we? Yeah, but I mean, how we would do that is by increasing the amount of business that's done in Scotland and the amount of vet investment that's made in Scotland. You know, by making it an attractive place to to invest. Mm -hmm. I mean, land prices must come in here. 
uh, because I, I think the point is, the competition point has been made by a number of the respondents. I think, um, you know, I would have thought again that the, the the land price would be a much bigger factor in the cost of the overall project than whether the tax rate was four, four and a half percent, or that kind of thing. Is that not the case? Well, land is you know, it's not a constant, and it depends between commercial and residential. But you know, typically it might be twenty percent. Of the of the cost of a, a typical development, so you know that's a, a sizable proportion of the amount of investment in, in a, a project. On the bigger projects, you know whether that's that tax is applied to the land element or in a, in a forward sale to the the full development value, that's a significant cost. You know, if, if you look at a city like Glasgow, I mean, clearly the land costs are higher in the West End than in the East End. Mm -hmm. But people want to build in the West End, and they don't want to build in the East End. Yeah. So, so there, it's not just a question of finding the cheapest place to go, yeah. is it? And, and in that equation, I mean, the tax, even if you had, say, 4% in the East End and 4.5% in the West End, you know, yeah. people would still want to be in the West End, wouldn't they? Well, they would, but, you know, the, the whole distribution, you know, in values, as I said before, we, we don't see it as being helpful and, and, and rather negative you know, to approach it from the point of view that you're you're dampening the interest in investing in, in one area, you know, compared to another. And what we'd rather see is, you know, stimulus being provided in the areas where we want to see improving values, you know, whether that's land values or, or overall property or, or commercial values. Mm. And there are better ways of, of doing that. I mean, have you done actual studies on the impact of this half percent difference on the non on the commercial? We, we haven't. We haven't. Uh, you know, had the, the opportunity to do that. But again, you know, I think simply, you know, starting from a base at which you're you're setting that rate and then waiting to see what happens mm -hmm. is is slightly slightly risky. Uh, so you know, the studies can be done over time, but you know, it may take a year or two for. You know the industry and uh, you know the, the Scottish government to to do that. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Horgan. Your paper um, on the first page you talk about um, the kind of balance between supporting the first-time buyers and the mid to higher values, and and you say uh, therefore creating too much of an imbalance within the market. I mean, some people would f feel that actually there already is a huge imbalance in the market and in society for that matter, and that some people have a huge amount of money and huge properties, other people have a little money and little properties, and actually this would kind of redress the balance a bit. Would you be open to that argument, or what do you think? How would you respond to that? Indeed, I am open to that argument, and just to reiterate, we, we welcome broadly the proposal that's been, been put forward. What we're seeking to do today is to suggest what we think will be refinements we're not suggesting a reduction in the overall tax take. We're just suggesting that it, the distribution of the tax could be more evenly spread. We're still in, you'll note in our paper, we're still supporting a reduction in the tax for the, the lower end of the market. We're supportive of that. Um, we just think that it could be more evenly spread towards the middle section so that we get that smoother distribution. Um, I think just, just to add some context on, on, onto the whole picture, we, we are in the midst still of a housing crisis with um, only 15,000 new homes, private and, and social homes, built over the last year. And um, we, we collect data from, from, from the majority of our members who deliver about 95% of all the new homes built in Scotland. So we've got a reasonable finger on the pulse in terms of what's happening. And... The early part of this year, we were seeing significant signs of growth. However, as the year has moved onwards, um, our forecasts are that this year housing output will be broadly the same. So we will go and see no, no increase in total housing output. So whichever way we look at it, we're not eating into the challenge, which is recognised by Scottish Government, of the need to increase housing output. So what we're looking to do is say, how can the new LBTT system support that growth, support that increase. And therefore, our paper is purely recommended of ways that we think that we could engineer the system. As I say, we welcome the removal of the slab system, but ways to further engineer it. And also to remove, I think, which David touched on, some of the bulk purchase, which will significantly impact large-scale investment, large-volume investment. Um, maybe switching around a little bit, but I think it's, it, it's relevant. Um, the Scottish Government has recently supported our organisation 
um, with the appointment of what is called a private rented sector champion. And his role is to attract institutional investment for the construction of large scale private rented properties professionally managed um, of the highest quality. So Scottish Government is supporting us in that, in that particular project. We, we, we need to have a professionally run, as, as we have in many parts of Europe, large-scale private rented sector. However, this new tax system, as it's proposed at the moment, actually undermines that because the tax that is proposed to be levied on large-scale multiple purchases is going to be significantly higher. So all we're looking to do is to, is to work towards how can we get the tax system, recognising that it needs to be the tax needs to be, to be gathered for all the reasons you've, you've pointed out, but looking to, to engineer to tweak that process to make it more effective in line with other policy uh, requirements. Yeah, Mr. You raised the point, which I think is an absolutely valid point, that you know, we, we, could, we need, do need more homes and houses. And I, I'm just thinking, you know, from a society's point of view, if we've got a million pounds, uh, do we want one house at a million pounds or do we want 10 for 100,000? And it seems clear to me based on your argument, we need more houses, let's have more at the bottom end, let's have more smaller houses or cheaper houses. That's what's going to benefit society. A few million pound houses isn't going to benefit us. So sh should, should we really be doing all we can to push the investment down at the bottom end and, and let the top end take care of itself? Um, I think that we need a mix of housing because, as I said, we need to have uh, a scale of, of people being able to move up through, the, as, as people's life um, position changes, as they have families, as their jobs require them to move around, they need, they need homes of suitable quality for their purposes. I mean, if we look at the northeast, um, the, the booming oil economy in, in Aberdeen, um, there's a need there for arguably higher, higher value properties. Um, if we don't cater for those, those particular higher net worth individuals, um, we have what's, what's recognised as a commuter society. People who will fly in, um, work their working week, maybe live in rented accommodation or a flat or whatever, and then move outwards again. So for the long-term sustainability of, the, of each economy, we need to have the appropriate mix of housing. Yes, we need housing at all levels. Um, you know, we need le housing at all levels across all tenures, um, and we're fully supportive of, of that argument. And it is, and that's evidence stories that's supported by each local authority developing their housing needs and demand assessments, which then feed into the local plans. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'd like to add to that yes. as well. You know, we we think the measures are correct in terms of. Uh, uh, you know, having a low tax rate or zero tax rate at the lower end of the market where clearly there's encouragement for those properties to be built and sold. So that's, that's good, you know, that's fine. But in the overall tax take here, there is going to have to be enough of the bigger properties which will in effect be applying or, or a tax will be collected in those properties in order to fund the tax that's not been collected in the, the lower market. And that has to be balanced. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay, Jamie, to be followed by Gavin. Thanks uh, very much, uh, convener. Um, Mr Hogg, uh, in terms of uh, your exchange there with uh, the deputy convener, you were suggesting that the rates should be altered to, to even out the rates to the middle of the market. We know that you've suggested a new band of 7% from £250,000 to £500,000, I presume that's what you're, you're talking about. But it's not really right to call that the, the middle of the market, is it? I mean, it's the middle, maybe it's the middle range in terms of rates, but we know that you know, the Scottish average house price is £170,000, and even in Edinburgh, where house prices are higher, it's £235,000. So to call this the middle of the market isn't quite telling the full story, is it really? Well... OK, let's call it the middle price band then in, in the range that's been put forward in the paper. I'm not making any... I'm not trying to attach a label uh, and with any socio-demographic meaning to it. I was talking in the range of bands which are from zero up to one million. I'm talking of that notionally being the middle range of numbers as opposed to middle incomes or middle house prices. Um, as, I, as I've said, and just, just to reiterate, we need the market to move at all levels. If the market stagnates at that point, that 325 to 500, then it won't release properties at the lower levels, 
for the first time buyers to move upwards. Um, if any of, and I'm sure many of us have moved throughout our lives, um, and we've been stuck in that notorious housing chain where you're waiting on the solicitor or you're waiting on your purchase that's buying yours before you move on to the next one. It, it, we're all familiar with the chain concept. If, and, and probably some of us may have had unfortunate experiences where the chains are broken down at various points. Um, and what we're saying is we need that section of the market, let's not call it middle if that causes a problem, but we need that section of the market to be able to move also. And, and, and I raised the point about um, diminishing equity. In previous years, many people moving on to their second or third properties had enough equity in their home to be able to afford the stamp duty. We've seen that, and I'm looking at some figures here, that uh, Scottish house prices are still still below their pre-crisis peak, um, looking at around about 4%, 4 the figures that I have here. So there's a lot of people that don't have that equity that they would have had traditionally, and we just think that that could create a problem. We're also already aware, with um, as reported by, by a number of our members, that um, a number of customers who had already reserved homes that were due to be moving in from April 2015 onwards have already come back to some of our member companies and said, well, all of a sudden I've realised I've got a bigger tax bill. What are you going to do about it? Um, because if, if you're unable to cover that additional tax bill, then you know we may have to cancel the purchase. Now, there'll be an element of trading and negotiation going on there, and that's, you know, that's, that's part of commercial life. Um, but for someone who's maybe a private seller, a second-hand property, that could jeopardise that chain. That could make the, the, the seller saying, well, I'm sorry, I can't lower my price any further because I can't afford to do it. And there's, there's already evidence of, of some movement around the bands. That, that's helpful. I welcome the, the clarification. I just thought calling the middle market might be a bit misleading, but I think you, you, you've clarified that uh, quite usefully. Uh, uh, turning to your uh, uh, paper, uh, Mr Stewart, and you did explore this uh, again with the, uh, the convener, the deputy convener, this whole issue of uh, mid-market uh, rental sector and, and how it could be affected. I think, though, you said that this was raised by one housing association. Could this be peculiar to areas where house values are, are higher than others. I mean, you, you said it was in Edinburgh. I mean, how many houses are uh, housing associations purchasing at, uh, over £135,000, which we know is the, the threshold for no value? I think the issue here is um, not so much over the cost of the individual house, but it's where it's multiple transactions. And they're then treated as a larger sum and then the tax, I think, is uh, applied as if it was a commercial transaction. So, I mean, you are right that um, it wouldn't apply across Scotland or to every housing association. You only really get mid-market rent where there's, as I said earlier, pressured market status. So maybe in the West End of Glasgow um, and Scotland's cities, certainly uh, Aberdeen and Edinburgh, um, and it's not um, something that applies to mid-market rent that's um, developed by the housing association. So, you know, I'm absolutely clear it's a relatively small proportion of, of transactions, but it would just be, um, for example, during the, the, the property crisis that Philip referred to, there were examples of quite large-scale purchases by housing associations where they bought properties from developers and then uh, either completed them or they were completed and they rent them for mid-market rent. So it's these sort of transactions in areas where maybe younger working people or, or people in slightly lower paid employment struggle otherwise to, to secure a, a quality property. I mean, I, I think you've, you've raised a, a reasonable concern here. Do, do you have, if we were to look at it further, do you have more sort of significant studies in relation to this area or, or work well, that you could provide yeah, us? Yeah, I haven't discussed it with the particular member who, who raised the issue. Um, the concern arose from uh, attending uh, an event uh, where uh, the, the speaker uh, was uh, a tax partner at a law firm, so I'd certainly be happy to go back to that member or, or go to the tax expert that raised the issue and just try and 
quantify what sort of sums we're talking about and you know exactly which transactions it would affect, we'd, we'd be glad to I mean, do th that. That would be helpful, even if it's you know a bit wider than that in terms sure. of, of others, that, that, that probably Absolutely. be better, yeah. better still. Yeah. But, um, thank, thank you. Yeah. Um, I think I may have an example to, to illustrate the point that, that, that David is, is, is making. Um, we, we've worked an example through on 50 flats at an average price of 150,000, just, just to select a random number. Um, so that would be a total purchase of seven and a half million pounds. And that could well be the sort of unit size that a housing association or an investor may, may be looking to do. Under stamp duty land tax, the tax that's in place at the moment, this, this stamp duty payable would be £75,000. Under the proposed new system of LBTT, that would be £131,100. So that's £56,000 more, a 75% increase. So you can see that the magnitude is, is significant. Um, it is it is a major increase, and this is the reason why for for housing associations and say and large scale investors, that increase of fifty six thousand could well be a, a deal breaker. That is that is quite significant. To be clear, your housing association's main business is exempt, is what you were saying in your paper. This is this relates yeah, to yeah, specific. I, 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 absolutely, th this is a specific thing to associations who do mid market rent and because of the rules around charities, do that through non-charitable subsidiaries. So it is quite a specific area and, and doesn't affect the majority of association developments. Notwithstanding that, though, I, I do think it's something we should maybe look at further. Can you so if Mr. Street can provide us more yeah, information? Yeah, that would be, be uh, quite uh, helpful. Um, my last uh, <coughs> area is uh, I wanted to raise uh, with Mr. Hamilton, because uh, I thought it was interesting, again, in exchange with... Uh, the deputy convener, you were saying you know, that the, the sector needs a stimulus, and I think you seem to be talking again at that the higher end. But surely, this these tax changes are providing a stimulus. I mean, we know that 95% of transactions are going to be either the same or less. We know that, given the average house price is, as I said, about £170,000, a transaction there, a person. Go through a transaction there, or how family go through a transaction, they would save nearly a thousand pounds. Even with the Scottish average for a detached property, you're looking at a saving of uh, two hundred fifty-seven pounds. So this, this, these tax changes are a stimulus, aren't they? Yeah, I did say that. You know, we did support the, uh, you know, the measures at the the, the lower end of the market. Um, but that's not the lower end. That's the average, though. That's not the lower end of the market. That is the average. No, but the the whole market has to be, as you know, we said before, it has has to be balanced, and we believe that there should be a full range of choice in the market. Otherwise, you know, if if people are pushed, you know, to making decisions that they wouldn't otherwise make, and we've set, you know, the tax regime or the whole basis of collecting the tax on, you know, assumptions that you know the, the assumption seems to be that. People who build or buy ex you know, expensive houses don't care about this. We, we don't think that's, that's right. We're talking mainly about residential property here. You know, anyone buying at any level of the market carefully considers the cost of that, that transaction. And if we, uh, if we don't set these uh, tax rates correctly, there will be distortion, there will be problems in us effectively subsidising, you know, lower uh, parts of the market. Well, you're saying that's uh, a, a subsidy, but surely you, it's stimulus. That's well, what the, the, stimulus. The, the bottom... It's stimulus in an area where more people are going to take it. Yes, we, we agree with the stimulus, but the, the stimulus has to be funded. <coughs> well, presumably it has been, because this is... Uh, this well, is the, 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 there is no tax being applied at the bottom rate, and that's, that's a good thing. That's you know that's absolutely correct. It's it's also the position now. So fundamentally, there isn't a change in that. You know, there is still fundamentally increased by the threshold being increased by ten thousand. Yes, it, yeah. Other than the, the, the ten thousand pounds, we haven't. We don't see that as being you know negative at all. We think that that can be supported. Um, but you know, fundamentally, at that lowest bracket, you know, tax isn't being collected, and it has to be collected elsewhere. And it can only be collected at the, the upper levels. The the tax 
band, you know, the the change in the tax band that's applied, you know, from two percent to ten percent will lead to people, you know, making decisions not to proceed with transactions that we would like to see take place. And and there should be a more even spread of tax being applied. I mean Mr Honeyman's organisation their members, 63% of respondents to a survey, his organisation undertook their members indicate the higher value property transactions should bear a, a larger share of the overall tax burden under LBTT compared to SDLT. That's what this is done. <laughs> it does bear a higher tax. It already bears a higher burden. That's, but this is not, by comparison. Well, it's, it's not like the that. principle that we're, we're disputing. It's the it's the amounts. It's the it's the changes in the in the the, the tax the tax bans and the tax rates. Okay, thank you. Um, Camilla, thank you. Um, start with, uh, with residential property as well in that case then. Um, if, if the tax bandings and levels proposed go through uh, in the budget as currently set out in the draft budget, can you just give me your sort of best case or, or your central scenario on what you think the impact overall will be on the housing market? To to any to, uh, to to anyone on the panel, um, I think that we're, we're already seeing evidence, um, which I mentioned a moment ago, of um, some short-term uh, shuffling round of, of housing transactions. Those people who had reserved a property, a new build property, and were planning to move in, um, let's say in January, February, March of next year, and now and, and, and are paying less than three hundred twenty-five thousand, are keen to defer, as you'd expect. You know, is there any chance we can? push our moving date back to April because we'll pay less tax. And those who are, have a higher tax, potentially a higher tax bill, are looking to do the opposite, trying to bring their purchase forward to get in under the existing rates. Um, and if, if those, if those are, are not able, if it's not possible to do that, then they're looking to our members to subsidise or, or to try and share some of the, uh, share some, some of the burden. I think that you know that's understandable. In any change of tax, there will be some short-term movement around. I think I think in the in the medium term, once the, the bans settle down and people become familiar with them, and I, and I have to say, I think there's some confusion around. Um, whilst we support the system removal of the of the slab rate, um, some people are, are already assuming that I have to pay, for instance, ten percent tax. When of course that's not the case. It's ten percent above. The ban. So there, there, there's some market um, communication needed, and some some people to become aware of that it's not as bad as maybe it, you perceive it to be. Um, as I say, my, our, our big concern is what happens into that middle. Uh, well, sorry, I'll, I'll stop calling it the middle. In that band of three to five to about five hundred thousand of those uh, those those sort of properties, and at, at this stage, it's it's difficult to. We're all putting our finger in the air and sort of guessing. Um, so I, I, I can't add any more in apart from sort of the short-term movement that, that, that we've seen um, just in and around when that changeover date is proposed. Just on the point is, it your, is it your contention then that it doesn't just, if, if you have the higher rates on houses over ultimately 325, your view or, or your organisation's view is it doesn't actually just impact those buyers and sellers, it actually has an impact on the market as a whole in terms of... It, it, it's all interconnected. It, it is all interconnected, and I gave you the illustration of the housing ladder, that, that if, if we create... Uh, stagnation is maybe the wrong word, but if we create, if we create uh, inertia in one part of the market, it will have a, a push-down effect on other parts of the market. You need the chain to be moving fluently and freely to have a healthy, functioning market. Um, and we think that if, if, if we could smooth out the graduation immediately above that 325 level, we think that we'd, we'd have a very, uh, a very good tax system. I think that the system that's been proposed is better than where we were. We're coming here today to suggest even better improvements on that. We, we think even better improvements. Okay. There's a, a phenomenon which we might refer to as sort of price crowding, which happens more with the slab uh, tax system where you know properties will or the market will price properties at the most attractive tax band and 
if it's not set correctly, then you may have too many properties that are being sold in the market at that price band. It's slightly easier to control that with the progressive rate of tax, but if you have very severe differences between the rates and the bands, then you, you'll still get that effect where there are too many properties being offered at a certain price point in the market, you know, for the market to, uh, to work effectively. Okay. On, on the, I mean, on the issue of you, you're saying you know some transactions might then not go ahead. The, the, you talked about the idea that people might just stay put, as it were. I mean, how 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 likely? I mean, it's it's, it's difficult to know, but how likely is that is that sort of behaviour uh, to to take place if if people feel um, they're going to be paying too much tax? But based on previous experience, even even re removing the the issue of of tax. Um, Price devaluation or price deflation in the housing market is is, is a real uh, a catalyst for stagnation uh, because people assume that their property is worth a certain amount. So if they're considering moving, they will have in their mind what they think the property may be worth. They may be having a reference point of a neighbour or a house adjacent that sold a year or two years back. And, and human nature suggests, well, if they achieve that price for theirs, ours must be at least worth X. Um, and in price deflation, um, when an agent or a property expert or a valuer comes to assess the property and says to the, the customer that your property you thought was worth this, I'm afraid it's only worth that, um, many people are deterred from moving, either A, thinking, well, I'll sit tight and wait for properties prices to improve, or simply say, well, I can't afford to move then. So that's, that, that is the effect of, of, of that situation. And there is potentially, I don't want to overstress it, but there is potentially in that price band area um, a, a risk of that happening. Okay. Um, and if, I mean, if, if that does happen, I mean, and you're saying it's a potential, if, but if there are fewer transactions than, than, than projected or predicted, obviously that affects the, the tax take at various levels. And, uh, and I think that's a good point because if if the tax take at that level is 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 uh, dampened, then that compromises the overall tax take, which is meant to offset mm. the lower tax take intended at, at the lower level. So the, there is a, a risk in that system, uh, which is very difficult, to, I suspect, to model and, and predict. Okay. Um, and the various uh, various sort of your organisations have then suggested amendments or tweaks to, to where we are. Um, if we start then for, with the Homes for Scotland, your, your proposal, I think, as I read it, was that you think there should be a rate of 7% between 250,000 and 500,000, but otherwise you would leave everything else as it, as it is? Uh, for, for the... For uh, residential. For, for residential, yeah. yes. I mean, there are some other suggestions around reliefs and other areas which we, we may or may not cover later, but broadly, yes, that's, that's our proposal. We, we also suggested uh, moving the uh, minimum level up to 135, but that was... With, with, with the absence of the, the full model of, of the data, we, were just, we suggested that to try and again offset or rebalancing, um, but we don't have the full data to be able to work out a fully costed model. Uh, of, of knowing uh, how, how that would deliver a total tax take. And just out of interest, what, what was your sort of reason for choosing the band of 250 to 500? Is that, do you see that as a particular band within the market as it currently exists? Yes, our members tell us that that is an important... Um, the the, the 250,000 has, has been historically a very significant price point in the market. Um, and as John has already mentioned, um, what, what's happened is, is because of the current... Uh, tax system, um, there's an enormous tax increase. In fact, I think I can tell you the number between 250 and or buying a property 249,990 goes to 250. I think the tax increase comes up, it goes from 2,500 to 7,500. So, you know, that's, you know, for the sake of an extra £1 on your property, you pay £5,000 in tax. What, what that effectively has created is that home builders cannot build construct, design and market a property anywhere near 250 or 275,000. There's a gap in the market. Um, now, we, we say this is the reason we welcome that, that, that easing that out, but that 250 to 500,000 is, um, is, we think, an important section of the market. Family homes for aspiring, growing families 
in some geographies, not all, I accept, and we think it's important to keep that, that part of the market moving. Beyond 500,000, well, I think we can all draw our own conclusions as to the affordability, but we think that part of the market is, uh, under the proposed system, is, is, is getting a, a, an increase, as I said, of uh, about 42% increase in tax, and we think that that could be spread a little bit, uh, a little bit further lower. Okay. And does the Scottish Property Federation have a have a similar view? Yeah, we, we do. We, we also suggested having a, a, a mid rate of uh, of five to six percent in the this the sort of band that uh, Homes for Scotland are, are suggesting. Um, the level, you know, house up to quarter of a million pounds these days, and you know, in terms of generally, Homes for Scotland are looking at new build property. You know, in in their own business sector, um, and you know, one of the key aspects of new build property is it has to be constructed, and there's only a certain amount of flexibility in the the cost of construction. So as you move up, you know, the the chain, there is potential for builders to you know provide a wider range of housing, qual high quality housing, and generally, you know, people will aspire to move to better properties. You know, we think that people should be encouraged to move to better properties. The more the more people that live in better properties, the better. So again, you know, we we welcome the stimulus that can be provided in the lower sector of the market. But you know, we also appreciate that you know people will you know look to move up the housing ladder. Most people will want want to do that, and we think the the tax regime has to be set in a way that that, that can that can function. Um, I'll move on to commercial uh, now, which again has been touched on already, um, and most of the discussion has been about uh, the 4.5% uh, top rate. Um, again, just for the record, can you, in terms of, I'm just trying to work out how, get a feel for how significant 4.5% is versus 4 in the minds of uh, the, the finance director or whatever company. It clearly is a factor. As other committee members have pointed out, there will be other factors as well, whether it's the price of the land, the return on investment, the skill set of the, uh, the workforce or anybody. There will be a whole range of factors in there. But is what you're saying is, are you, are you saying that though the 4.5% the will be, it is a factor, but how significant a factor, in your view, will that be when investment decisions are taken? Well, again, you know, we should consider, you know, commercial and the residential market has to be considered here as well in terms of the fact that the land aspect of any house building is a commercial transaction. So house building isn't, you know, it's not set apart from this, this argument. And uh, broadly, you know, the, the market, the housing market now has been carried on well, the main by the, the larger UK house builders, you know, a lot of the smaller players in the market uh, house builders, small house builders have, you know, unfortunately gone out of business over the last five or six years. Um, I've got direct experience of, you know, the point that uh, was made earlier by Philip, uh, you know, in terms of a UK national house builder making its decision as to whether it invests, buys land in West Lothian or in Yorkshire. And that decision-making process was being made at a time, you know, where these proposals had yet to, to, to come through. So I know that that would impact potentially quite negatively, you know, on the chief executive's decision in whether he buys a site in West Lothian or a site in Yorkshire. Um, in the commercial area, it's still, as, as I said before, it's a cost, but there are a number of large commercial developers that operate only within the UK. So for them, there is still that change in the regime between uh, Scotland and the rest of the UK. Um, wider than that, you know, some of the major projects that are invested, you know, it, we're encouraging investment in the Edinburgh financial sector. And uh, I mentioned the Haymarket project before, and you know, projects of that scale run to a cost of tens of millions of pounds. There are other examples in, in Glasgow, and Glasgow has a, an emerging financial sector as well. Um, investment, whether it's in London, 
Edinburgh or Glasgow will still be made based on you know the cost of that transaction and if it's it may be seen as marginal but it's still a difference in the cost of carrying out and going through with with that investment which we would think would be more you know appropriately considered in terms of the potential loss of some transactions not proceeding and in the kind of projects that we are considering here you know projects valued in tens of millions of pounds there will be potentially thousands of jobs connected to those projects either going ahead in Edinburgh and Glasgow or Aberdeen or going ahead in in Leeds so you know the stimulation that gives to the economy and the number of jobs it creates we think should be considered directly against the the benefit of applying an, an extra half percent on the tax cost over the rest of the UK. Okay, if, if I if I understand it right, then the the, the crossover point for uh, commercial property is is around about two million. Yeah. Is that right? So so if if a project is under two million, actually they'll end up paying slightly less tax. Yes. Going forward, but yeah. if it's over two million, they'll end up paying more tax. Is that is that broadly? Yeah, that uh, uh, similar to the uh, the C two five yeah. in, in residential. Okay, so so sort of my sort of my question then is from if people looking out, out from outside of Scotland, um, either operating UK wide, um, or, or only operating in the UK and looking about which part of the UK to invest in, what. What sort of proportion of, of inward investment projects, if you like, would be below the two million mark, and what sort of proportion are in the, um, you know, above the two million mark? Um, we think that the tax, in terms of value, the the amount over two million pounds, I think, is about seventy five percent of the of the market value. Um, so it's proportionally a higher area where you know in terms of value where that business has been done so that the amount of value which has been taxed there is being taxed at uh, at the at the full rate um you know there could actually be an argument for saying that to attract those particular types of project the larger project you know in the, the financial sectors of Edinburgh and glasgow you may want to consider you know how you could actually Create a you know a stimulus to attracting that 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 investment, and part of that stimulus could be through, if not exactly easing, or reducing the, the top rate for larger projects. Um, you know it could be considered that you know at that point you just have to flatten the the tax rate so that you're not creating uh, an obstacle to that sort of investment that potentially would generate a lot of jobs. Grateful, thank you. Good thank you. Just before I, I let Gina in, just can you give me an example of these uh, projects that could uh, provide thousands of jobs, and also um, Gavin asked specifically, um, you know, that you know what proportion of projects, not value, but proportion of projects would be over the two million rates. I'm just wondering if you can answer those two questions. Value. No, he didn't mention value in his question. Right. Because your paper clearly states seventy five percent of value, but mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you could have ten projects. From an inward investment point of view, as opposed to projects in total. Okay, thanks. I mean, you have ten projects at two million pounds, and one at sixty million, and three quarters of the value is the sixty million project. But I'm just wondering, how many of these projects are we actually talking about, and how many would provide, you know, well, to answer your question, thousands. Executive of a, a development company jobs. that sells serviced land to mm -hmm. to house builders. You know, that's that's what I do in my day job. Um, we don't sell. I mean, it's our typical transaction for serviced land only is six or eight million, which is the sort of scale at which a house builder will, will buy um, possibly 150 houses. Um, house builders these days do not pay up front for development land. They, they pay the, the landowner or the, you know, the, the main developer in instalments. So that's, that's a cost to us to, to sell that serviced land. I think these sort of transactions, the numbers, and, and I don't have an exact number, but you know, I would say that the number of these transactions that are going to be impacted by this will will be quite high, because you know the, the house builder or a, a house builder will typically you know be buying land for 
100 houses plus. And in most parts of Scotland, in the housing market, that's going to be a transaction just for land value of four to five million pounds or, or more. So that's a fairly typical transaction. Okay, thanks. Jean? Thank you, convener. Just a, a, a couple of points. Going back to the, uh, your recommendation that there should be another band, another, a different, different tax band in what we will call the middle, um, for the moment, where would you see that tax then being increased? If we, if we make that reduction, obviously that's a reduction in, in budgetary terms for the government. Would you put it on the higher? Would you increase the higher band? Or would you uh, change the tax bands on the lower properties? I think, as, as I maybe I pointed out a moment ago, without seeing how the modelling has been, having access to the modelling, it's difficult to know what the difference is to, to make up. Hence the reason we suggested moving the bottom one up from 125 to 135. Um, but not knowing what the gap is to plug, it's difficult to know where that, uh, where, where that might uh, come in. And, and I think that the, the other factor to take into consideration is, is that, um, as, as we've said, you know, taxes have, can have the effect of, of stifling activity or transactions, but the opposite is true. Um, you know, taxes can actually stimulate activity, so they can be net contributory. Um, no, I'm not an economist, so I'm not going to suggest for a moment that if we tweak this and did that, then transactions would. But that, that's the sort of thinking, I think, is, is, is as I said, and I want to reiterate, because we, we genuinely do believe that this is a, a good forward move in the right direction to, to the model. Um, we think it's a great opportunity for Scottish Government to see how they could use tax powers to actually stimulate the economy. And we think the model is a good first step. We're suggesting refinements to make that model even further. But I, I couldn't suggest, you know, what, what would need to be tweaked by, by what amount. In our own proposal, we're still suggesting it would still mean that purchasers, uh, if I look at my own figures, I think purchasers still above uh, about 400,000 would still be paying more than they would do under the current system. So we're not suggesting giving them a free ride, but we're just saying to reduce that burden just from what it's suggested at the moment. Um, and can I ask, what, what do you think is the greatest need for housing in Scotland today? Where, wh wh what is the greatest demand for developers to build? Is it one-bedroom houses no, in order to... Is uh, it two-bedroom houses? Well, that, that part of the market probably isn't, isn't been addressed, you know, adequately enough... At the moment, as Philip said, we're at the moment only building about half of uh, Scottish Government targets, uh, which were set you know, prior to, to the recession. Targets were being set at something like 30,000. The industry collapsed to you know, a level where it was only building 10 or 11,000. And the whole issue at that point then became who is able to access mortgage funding to, to buy a, a property and generally speaking it wasn't the people that were looking to buy one bedroom flats it was you know middle income families growing families who were employment two people in employment with good credit records and could con continue looking to to buy new properties so so that's the part of the market which has been held up over the last few years it has created a shortage of choice again, you know, at the lower end in, in the flatted development market, uh, mortgage funding is beginning to ease now, and there are mortgage products available for the people that have been denied mortgages uh, a few years ago. So that's a, it's a huge part of the market that has to come back. But the social or RSL sector housing associations have filled part of the gap, but they won't make up that massive, you know, 50 or 60 percent deficit that we've had in the in the housing market over the last few years. So there has to be, you know, wider choice. And I think it goes back to the point that we we see it as being critical that the whole market, you know, there is a wide range of choice for for the whole of the housing market, and you know, there there aren't artificial barriers being put in place where people will choose to stay, you know, in less valuable property. Um, the whole market, in order for it to work, there has to be 
trading in the market, both from the lower end and through the middle and into the upper uh, ranges in the market. OK, thank you. Um, Mr Stewart, I think uh, in your submission you raised the issue of energy efficiency and allowances for that. What would that look like if it was, if it was uh, addressed? Um, without um, presuming to develop a detailed proposal, I, I think that would be something that would really best be done by the Scottish Government in consultation with, with stakeholders. Um, what we're really suggesting is um, a variation on the tax where a, either people pay slightly more a if a property is less energy efficient and pay slightly less if it's more energy efficient than the average. Um, we wouldn't propose that this would have a huge impact on the level of the tax, but more that would send a signal that um, energy efficiency is something that, that should be valued uh, as the Scottish Government set, up, set out in the sustainable housing strategy. And, you know, We'd be glad to to contribute to the the development of proposals, but it's really more an idea of it being a nudge to encourage um, either a situation where a buyer maybe has the the chance of looking at a, a couple of flats that are in the the same area, a uh, roughly the the same value, the same size. We feel it would make sense to favour um, through the taxation system, the one that's most energy efficient, or where someone's looking to, to sell a property, you know, they may then see the benefit in uh, investing in lower cost energy efficiency measures such as uh, cavity wall insulation or loft insulation, if there's a taxation benefit and, and it you know, makes it seem more more um, attractive to buyers. Um, I mean, just to reiterate, we don't see this as being the solution that, that that's going to hugely increase Scotland's, um, you know, the energy efficiency of Scotland's properties. We see it as something that could be part of a, a suite of measures, such as um, grant being available, minimum standards being set and gradually raised that, that could help Scotland work towards meeting its climate change targets? I mean, I think the Vice Convener did say that we took evidence already and, and really that, that stopped being an issue. It wasn't seen uh, that this was the place to address it, uh, energy efficiency. And it, it occurs to me that what you're saying is somebody would pay higher tax and then they pay higher fuel bills. I, I appreciate that point, um, I, and that is something that any design of incentive would have to be careful of, but I think the, the aim would be that longer term, uh, by incentivising investment in energy efficiency, homeowners uh, would be paying lower fuel bills. I mean, it's predicted um, by the UK Office of Budget Responsibility that Broadly speaking, fuel bills will rise above inflation for the next 17 years. So really, e even relatively minor investments or incentives to improve the energy efficiency of housing could help address that issue and, and at the same time reduce carbon emissions. And I mean, it seems to me, I, I don't know whether you will agree that the, I mean, the industry, your industry is, is fairly conservative, small c. In this respect, do you think it's lagging behind in, in terms of energy efficiency and the kind of, the kind of uh, difference it could be making already to the houses that it's building? Um, I, I wouldn't ag agree with that particularly. Um, I would also say, um, I, and this doesn't apply just to social housing, but to all housing, um, the great challenge is not so much for new build housing, where there are energy efficiency standards to be met, and where that broadly results in, in fuel bills being relatively affordable. The great challenge is in existing housing. Um, our members have, have the most energy efficient housing by tenure in Scotland, but with fuel bills rising, you know, there's always the opportunity to, to do more. Um, and a particular issue if it comes to the energy efficiency of our members' housing is it's often a challenge for them 
where they own properties in mixed tenure stairs, such as traditional tenements in Edinburgh or Glasgow. They might be the minority owner. They would like to um, invest in improved energy efficiency of properties, but they might not be able to persuade either private owners or a, a letting agent to participate in, in increasing the energy efficiency. So, again, by having this mechanism, it would help provide an incentive along with the Scottish Government grants for the private sector just to push people to, towards thinking about investing in energy efficiency. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, concluded the questions from committee, but I have just one or two to finish off with. First of all, just to follow on from um, uh, Jean Urquhart's questions, actually, to Mr Stewart. I mean, like, we did take quite extensive evidence on this, and the issue really in, in terms of the bill was that... Uh, no one could come up with a workable scheme, frankly, and you yourself said basically the Scottish Government should come up with one, you know, um, and you would contribute to that, but that, that's really the issue. No one has come forward with that, and the Scottish Government and the committee really took the view that this wasn't the place to do it because it would overtly um, complicate the, the, the taxation bill. There would be other ways in which we could actually uh, look at that particular uh, issue. The, the question I, uh, just I want to finish on, it, just to really kind of round up our discussions, because it's not been touched on, and it was extensively discussed, really, in terms of the bill again, but hasn't come up to date, is really the issue of subsale relief. Uh, Mr Hamilton, and you, you, you've um, focused in, in sections 8.6 and 8.7 of your own uh, submission on that. Um, and um, you're obviously quite critical of what the, the Scottish Government has, uh, has come up with. So I'm just wondering if you can really kind of talk us through your views on subsidy relief. Yes. Um, we would you know, like to point out that the, the principle of, of subsidy relief, as we understand it, is still being maintained in the proposals, and uh, there are two instances where, you know, it's, it's quite commonplace for subsidial relief to take place. One would be in the example I gave earlier of a landowner selling a, a piece of land to uh, a developer, a master developer, say, and that master plan developer then selling the land forward potentially on, and normally on the same day. So the transaction takes place from the original landowner through a developer and then to uh, a house builder. Um, the, the principle of taxation on the, the, the two or, or on the transactions, that, that is one parcel of land. You know, it's one item which is being taxed, but it would be taxed twice, you know, in the transaction between the landowner and the master plan developer and then that developer and, uh, and the house builder. So subsale relief, you know, that principle of relaxation from that already exists. And what we're concerned about is the, you know, getting into a protracted process where relief on the double stamp, as it used to be called, is, uh, is then obtained. And in that situation, you're potentially sort of trapping the original landowner into a process which took, could take many years to reclaim the, the tax. He's selling his land. It's not always, you know, an automatic uh, option as to who actually pays the, the stamp duty as it was, or LBTT now. And in house building, you know, as I said before, some of these plots of land could be very considerable in size and might take many years to, to develop. So it's not an easy, that wouldn't be an easy situation for, you know, a completion certificate to be generated that would allow a uh, reclaim of, of the tax. So in a way we think it's, it's a problem it doesn't need solving because it's accepted that uh, tax has been applied twice and you know, if that transaction, as I say, occurs literally on the same day, then relief should be should be granted, and, and in our view, it should be granted, you know, promptly, uh, you know, sort of commensurate with the, the original land transaction. Okay. And you've said, obviously, um, the notion of a relief where tax is paid and might only be refunded at a later date, subject to many risks and potential delays, is not viable. Yes. Well, yeah, again, I'm... The, the instance I gave there is in the 
case of a, a large-scale housing development, which, as I say, might take some years to be developed and might involve a number of completion certificates. The, the other area where we have a concern is on uh, commercial development, where there are situations of uh, you know, forward sale arrangements being made on a, on a, a transaction. But you know, fundamentally, again, we're talking about the same piece of land that is bought by a developer and is then improved and developed and possibly in a number of years will be, will be sold on. So it's not an easy process to try and assess when completion would occur and when a certificate would be available. And, and you know, the definition of the certificate we see has been quite problematic. Um, we think it's too uh, confusing or, or potentially, you know, a, a kind of fraught process that would be applied there to, you know, what we see as being a problem that doesn't really need solved because the industry is not evading tax. It is pre currently it's paying the, the correct amount of tax on the transaction. If it's paid twice and the rules are applied, then it's it's repaid. And you know we think that situation should uh, should continue. Does any other witnesses have a comment to make, Mr. Hogg, on this issue? Uh, just just to concur with the point that, that John has has made. I mean, it, fr from our members' perspective, uh, we, we recognise the the, the 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 example that John has has mentioned. But quite often, we'll, there'll be a situation where a lead developer will be buying a large piece of land from a landowner but his intention is never to build all of that land out himself. Um, it will be too large, so he would want to sell it parcels of it to smaller developers um, because it would be too much of a transaction, but the landowner prefers to deal with on a one-to-one -one basis with the lead developer. The, the system that we understand that's been proposed is that the tax would have to be paid up front, but then the tax could only be reclaimed once the secondary or the sub-developers had produced completion certificates. So that means the lead developer is taking all of the risk and all of the forward funding of the cash flow and putting all of his trust and reliance on the sub-developers of doing their, keeping their part of the arrangement. Now, you know, <coughs> n n well, very few people projected the financial crash that we've been through, but if we were to have another scenario like that where the sub-developers, for whatever reason, didn't complete their parcels of work, didn't build their homes, the lead developer, through no fault of his own, is, is out of pocket. So that risk is very clear to, to our members now, and, it's, it, and that, the way that will manifest itself is lots of lead developers will be very wary about taking that risk on behalf of someone else, something they have no control over. Um, so we would seriously ask that consideration to be given to this. As John has said, we're not looking at any, there's, there's no issue around tax avoidance, it's all about risk and cash flow. Um, and, and we think the system as proposed needs, needs further consideration. Okay. Um, anyone else want to comment? Okay, well that's concluded our uh, evidence. I just want to ask uh, our witnesses if there's any final points you wish to make on any aspect of uh, what we've discussed today. No, no. Mr Honeyman? I, I think basically the, the, the proposal in terms of the, the, the new tax and such like is generally welcomed. I think it's, it's, it's moving things in, in, the, in the direction that's, 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 uh, that's, that's going to be beneficial to the industry. The, the, the thing that's been difficult for to get the head round is that we don't. I don't think all of us down here don't have access to what the, the modelling and such like of the the tax take is going to be, and that has a significant impact in terms of the numbers. Because obviously, if it's to be tax neutral across in terms of it generating a a full um, it's almost a similar amount to what has been taken in previous years, then obviously where these bands and such like are set has a significant bearing on that, and that's one of the that's one of the things that I think if if the bandings were set. That, that makes the thing the, the transition smoother and seem to be relatively fair across the across the spectrum that's going to be ben beneficial i think the difficult is is by tweaking one end to, that might stimulate the economy it has an impact further up the up the line that's the the dilemma that, that sits here and i said obviously we don't have access to the to the numbers that would uh, allow that model to be tweaked out well, thank you very much um, um 
and uh, just now to call a, a five minute uh, recess uh, for an actual break for members and we'll reconvene just after ten past eleven.
of uh, business today seek evidence on further fiscal devolution. I therefore welcome to the meeting Professor Jim Gallagher, member of Nuffield College, Oxford, and visiting professor of Glasgow University. And members have copies of a paper from the witness, so we will go straight to questions. And uh, Professor Gallagher, the way things work here, as I'm sure they are in most uh, committees, is that I, as convener, will ask opening questions. And then, yes, well, I could just put my feet up and pass it to the Deputy Convener, but I don't think that would be appropriate. I'll ask some opening questions, trying not to hog all the juicy ones, and um, uh, we'll then pass, uh, 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 we'll open up the session to uh, colleagues who will then ask their own questions. So, first of all, let's quote directly from your paper. Um, on the second page, under the section, what further devolution is seeking to achieve, you say, and I quote, the objective of widening the powers of the Scottish Parliament is to enable it to deliver a different combination of taxes and public services from the UK as a whole, uh, while still sustaining the risk-sharing benefits of being part of the UK. Increased tax powers play their part in this by giving the Parliament the opportunity to spend more or less. And you talk about whatever balance is set must, if the promises made in the campaign to be kept, be consistent with retaining Barnet. And then you go on in this, the next page, uh, talking about income tax, um, which you say is the most obvious to devolve, and you say it's certainly possible to extend that, and you say uh, it would continue to be set by the UK Parliament, in your view. So I'm just wondering, um, to what extent uh, should income tax uh, be devolved? Uh, for example, uh, rates, bans, thresholds. OK, um, that's very helpful, Chairman. Uh, uh, perhaps I should just say in... Um introduction that anything I've got to say here today is purely what I think, uh, because I've advised all sorts of people over the years, and none of them is to blame uh, for what I've got to say today. Um, I think you're right to um, preface your question uh, by trying to state what the purpose of further devolution is. And in my view, uh, the purpose of further devolution um, is to give this Parliament uh, the range of powers and responsibilities which will enable it to reflect a different set of preferences in Scotland for, among other things, uh, the mixture of taxation and spending. Uh, and if Scotland takes a different view from the rest of the UK, uh, the Scottish Parliament should be able uh, to implement that view. Uh, but to do so uh, at a time uh, when, uh, or in a way which preserves those risk-sharing benefits. And that's quite important, I think, uh, in understanding uh, the nature of the revolutionary settlement. Uh, so far as income tax in particular is concerned, uh, I think the obvious argument for the devolution of income tax is that, first of all, the Parliament, even today, has some influence over it, though it uh, has never exercised that. In 2016, it will be required to set uh, a Scottish rate of income tax under the Calman scheme, uh, which, uh, uh, with which I was associated. Uh, and uh, I think there is certainly scope to go further than that. Uh, the challenges to doing so um, are as follows. Uh, the first is that income tax is a redistributive tax. It is the only substantial part of the taxation system which is redistributive across income groups. Rich people pay most of the income tax. Right? Uh, you, the numbers I can't remember if I quoted the numbers in my evidence, uh, but the numbers are well known. The vast majority of income tax receipts uh, comes from higher rate taxpayers. And that means it's redistributive across social groups, and it's therefore also redistributive across geography, because rich folk live in one place and less well-off folk tend to live in another. And it also means, therefore, uh, that at the moment uh, when income tax is shared across the UK, uh, the pooling of income tax is redistributive across the UK. So the first and most interesting question uh, is whether over the long run uh, the complete devolution of income tax would be to Scotland's fiscal benefit or not. First question that requires to be asked. Uh, it may be uh, that the view would be taken that it is sufficiently important to devolve income tax that Scotland would be willing to give up any potential upside, uh, or if there were any, any potential downside from sharing income tax. But if so, it should do so with its eyes open and with an understanding uh, that what it was doing uh, was ceasing to pull and share that very salient element of taxation resource across the entire UK. 
Uh, the second challenges are more complex and maybe um, uh, more amenable to technical solutions, but nevertheless would require to be uh, addressed properly uh, before a wise parliament would argue for the complete devolution of income tax. Uh, the first question is not a partisan question, though it's often presented as such, and that is, uh, if income tax is devolved in Scotland, what happens about income tax in the rest of the UK, and who makes that decision? And in particular, let's just use England to mean the rest of the UK, and I intend no offence to people in Wales and Northern Ireland if I omit them from this, but the principle is the same. Uh, if English, if English, if um, income tax becomes a Scottish tax, does it also become an English tax? And if it is an English tax, which members of Parliament decide upon it and why? If, unless that question is properly answered, uh, I don't see uh, that a sensible scheme for the devolution of income tax can be devised. And the third question which requires to be answered is what is the effect on the issue that you mentioned, Chairman, the Barnett formula? Now, let us imagine that the Barnett formula remained unchanged from what it is today and income tax was devolved. Uh, if the UK government decided, for the sake of argument, to increase income tax uh, in the UK, let us say to spend on some reserved service, Social Security, let's say, uh, then Scots would get the benefit of that tax rise, additional Social Security payments, uh, without paying any contribution. Conversely, if the UK government decided to increase income tax, to spend, let us say, on the health service in England, to increase the NHS budget, Scotland would get, if the Barnett formula applied, a commensurate benefit in the form of a consequential population share without, in, without paying the commensurate tax rise. So how, a technical challenge perhaps, uh, should, uh, how can one devolve income tax and preserve the Barnett formula as it's currently constructed? Those are the challenges that would have to be addressed if the whole of income tax were to be devolved. Those challenges do not require to be addressed under the scheme of the Scotland Act 2016. Okay. Um, well, firstly, I don't think you answered my question, so I'll ask them again mm -hmm. specifically. But you could, one could, uh, could say then that they could raise income tax to spend on trading, which Scotland might not want. But to go back to the question that I asked specifically, which was to what extent, given the caveats that you've actually uh, introduced, should uh, income tax be devolved? And again, what's your view on um, devolution of rates, bans and thresholds? Okay. Um, I think that there are... I think there is, uh, let me deal with rates, bans and thresholds first of all. Um, I think there is um, a strong argument uh, for the maintenance of, first of all, uh, a single definition of income for income tax purposes. Uh, so uh, what constitutes income and what doesn't, not least because that relates to other taxes such as capital gains, but also because it's absolutely critical uh, for the uh, operation of a sensible pension system across the UK. Uh, I think it's right to say that uh, the threshold at which income tax becomes payable, that is to say the personal allowance, uh, should be retained on a UK basis because it relates very closely uh, to social security benefits and notably uh, to income tax credits, uh, to tax credits, uh, which are paid through the income tax system but are strictly speaking a social security benefit. I think one can make an argument, to be honest, either way uh, for the variation of uh, the bounds of the higher and top rate bands. Uh, and I think that there are arguments in, in both directions there. Um, in any view, it seems to me uh, that one should regard uh, the UK tax rates and bands as the benchmark, because that is the reality of how the financial system works. Indeed, it's also the political reality. But subject to that, uh, I would be entirely relaxed about the Scottish Parliament having the power to vary those. Thank you. So, so how much do you think um, should be devolved in terms of... 
to what extent should income tax be devolved and what's your personal view on that particular issue? Is that I, I do not think that the first of the problems that I have identified, that is to say the lack of sharing and redistribution, uh, is a problem which can be solved if income tax is devolved. No one simply has to say either I think that sharing resources is so important and so uh, much in Scotland's interest that not all of income tax should be devolved. Uh, uh, and the argument goes either way in that. I think I'm personally on the side of going for it, actually. Uh, if the, but subject only uh, to the other problems I have been describing uh, being able to be addressed and the process of devolution, and the way in which income tax is devolved being such as those problems are solved. What about the, the opportunity to design a more efficient uh, tax system? Uh, um, HMRC, for example, advised uh, uh, members that uh, some 34 billion, 6.8 per cent of the of the income tax take wasn't collected in 11, 12. I'm just wondering, is there an opportunity in, in uh, devolving income tax to develop a, a more effective and more efficient system of collection, given all the, the difficulties of the UK system? Um, I don't think that. Um, there is any reason to suppose that a Scottish income tax would be any more or less efficient uh, in its problem of collection than a UK income tax. My view is that it would be entirely uh, unwise to create a Scottish separate Scottish collection system. I think Scotland should rely on HMRC uh, to do the tax collection uh, for two reasons. Uh, one, economies of scale, uh, uh, and two, it's much easier for employers and employees uh, to deal with a single tax authority as they have uh, employers with employees in one, more than one part of the UK and, and employees who might move from one part of the UK uh, to another. Uh, I, I don't dispute, in fact, I'm sure it's entirely the case, uh, that HMRC uh, could, uh, if it had the resources and the power, uh, collect more of the tax that's due, but there's no reason to assume that devolution uh, uh, to Scotland would, would make that any more or less likely. So I favour uh, an integrated tax collection system. If it was a principles-based system rather than a rules-based system like they have in the UK, would that be more effective, do you think? Um, I wouldn't claim to be an expert uh, uh, on um, different methods of um, tax collection, um, but uh, in another part of my life I deal with a principled-based system uh, in the regulation of the financial services industry, and I can tell you, as a matter of practice, it defaults into a rules-based system. OK. Um, let's move on then to other taxes. You say that uh, a number of other minor taxes may be devolved uh, or might be considered for devolution. I'm just wondering if you can uh, talk us through those. For example, air passenger duty, inheritance tax, uh, capital gains, excise duty, vehicle tax, these kind of taxes. I'm just wondering if you can tell us your views on which, uh, if any of these, should be devolved and, and why. Argument for air passenger duty being devolved, it was recommended by the Calvin Commission. I think the only issue it required to be addressed there is whether there is scope for, as it were, predatory tax competition with north of England airports. Um, subject to that, I don't see why uh, it, it, um, it shouldn't be devolved. Um, excise duties, I think, create a problem. Um, uh, as the committee will be aware, um, uh, Scotland is a big contributor to excise duties because we smoke and drink too much. Uh, but we uh, would face the same difficulty uh, as the UK as a whole does uh, with white vans going back and forward across the channel. Uh, white vans might well go back and forward uh, up and down uh, the M74. So I think there are real avoidance risks either way, whether Scotland taxes more or taxes less uh, in respect of excise duties. As far as the uh, that I'm talking there about excise duties on um, tobacco and alcohol, I personally would favour the devolution of vehicle excise duty, uh, because although cars move about, registered keepers do not. And that's actually a substantial tax, which could be devolved, in my view. Uh, and uh, one sees it decentralised in some countries. It's decentralised in France, for example. There's a price to be paid. Uh, the price is that vehicle Vehicles owned by fleet owners uh, tend to register themselves in the lowest tax jurisdiction, uh, and it might be that uh, uh, some sort of anti-avoidance rule of that sort uh, to deal with that problem uh, would have to be devised. But that excise duty uh, could be, I think, devolved. In principle, 
Um, I have no difficulty with the devolution of capital gains tax, which is a personal tax, very like income tax. But I do wonder if the game is worth the candle. It doesn't raise very much money, and it's a highly complex tax. You would think the same would be true of inheritance tax, though international experience uh, suggests uh, that it is a tax which creates distortions. Uh, rich people try to, try to die in the lowest tax jurisdiction. There's Australian history on this. Uh, look at the devolution of um, uh, death duties uh, in Queensland. It's an interesting example. Okay, thank you. Right. Uh, now, in, in terms of uh, financing welfare devolution, you talk about um, you know, devolving some uh, individual uh, benefits, such as housing benefit and attendance allowances. And I just wonder if you can tell us your thinking as to why some could be devolved should be devolved and why others shouldn't? First of all, I take the view that um, the deal that the Scottish people signed up to in the referendum campaign was a deal in which there was social solidarity across the UK and that there was risk sharing. And the principal but not only element of risk sharing is the social security system. And therefore, in my view, uh, the core of the social security system should not be devolved. Uh, old age pensions, uh, uh, at the core of it, which are the largest single benefit, certainly should not be devolved. Uh, there are good principled reasons for that, uh, and it's, of course, in Scotland's interest because of our differential age structure, as is projected over the next several decades. It would cost us a lot more uh, because we'll have more old people. Uh, there is, however, I'm going back to where I started, uh, Chairman, in these questions, uh, at least a perception, and perhaps it's the reality, that uh, the Scottish people would be willing to pay more taxes for a more generous welfare system. And there are, in principle, two ways in which you could achieve that. And this is, uh, we're on to the substance of welfare devolution before we talk about the financing of it. One way is to take certain individual benefits and devolve them and enable the Scottish Parliament to take a decision about them. Um, the most obvious one in that context is housing benefit, uh, because housing benefit is received by most poor people. It's a very large benefit, and of course it is already at the moment administered by local authorities, uh, uh, although it is to be folded into universal credit. Um, in my view, that is entirely possible and would give the Scottish Parliament real choices about the level of support uh, that poor people received from the state. The alternative way of doing it is to give the Scottish Parliament power to alter the rates of UK benefits, uh, perhaps universal credit, or perhaps simply the housing element of universal credit. That would have the same net effect. It might be administratively easier. Uh, in either event, it seems to me that the fiscal challenge or the fiscal burden uh, should be, which falls upon the Scottish Parliament, which affects the Scottish devolved budget, should be, as it were, the difference between what the UK pays its citizens and any extra that the Scottish Parliament chooses to pay. That avoids the problem of widening the so-called vertical fiscal gap between the Parliament's own resources and its budget. Thank you. Now, just on borrowing powers, you say that a good case can be made that all Scottish governmental government capital spending should be funded by borrowing from the markets and either subject to the control of not underwritten by the UK government and uh, in fact the Scottish Futures Trust is something uh, similar to paper too. So I'm just wondering if you can elaborate a wee bit more on your thinking on this issue. Uh, as you will know, Chairman, at the moment uh, the Scottish uh, government has very limited borrowing powers. Um, uh, it has today uh, some small capital borrowing powers under the Kalman scheme, uh, and it has a short-term borrowing facility that so far it's never had to use. Um, an additional... Let, let me go back to first principles. Uh, the principle that we're seeking to uh, give effect to here is that the Scottish Parliament should have the ability to have a bigger or a smaller budget uh, if that is what the Scottish people want, subject to the risk-sharing arrangements. Uh, that uh, taxation powers give you that uh, in relation to revenue spending, uh, and it is borrowing which should give you that capacity in relation to capital spending. 
Uh, the Scottish Parliament's uh, uh, budget for capital is approximately £3 billion a year. It's of that order. Um, at the moment, that is not financed by borrowing, but it's financed directly by Treasury grant uh, as part of the, the block grant. It seems to me that if we're in the borrowing powers business, and we should be in the borrowing powers business, it should apply to all of the Scottish Parliament's borrow, uh, capital expenditure. Uh, and then the Scottish Parliament would, would then bear, of course, the interest cost of the Scottish budget would bear the interest cost, which seems to me is right. Uh, if those borrowing powers are to be widened, yeah, it, th that can happen if and only if the tax powers of the Parliament are widened. But if the tax powers are widened, the scope for the Scottish Parliament to borrow and, of course, pay back uh, uh, should be widened as well. It seems to me that there is little actual uh, need uh, for the UK to set a cash limit uh, on this borrowing because the markets will set that cash limit anyway. Uh, the borrowing by the Scottish Parliament should be a first charge on devolved tax revenue, as legally it is for local authorities at the moment. Uh, and uh, the markets will swiftly take a view as to how much borrowing it is prudent uh, for the Scottish Parliament or the Scottish Government to undertake. OK, well, thank you very much. It's very helpful. Just one last uh, question, really, uh, before we uh, open up to uh, colleagues uh, around the table. Um, just it's about proceeding in stages. Now, the Calman process you know, was agreed in December 2007 and won't be implemented until 2016. Um, but you're talking about major changes in, uh, which carry high risks in implementation and they should be implemented in a phased way. Now, throughout your paper, you've talked about what this, the people of Scotland voted for, but there's a there's obviously quite a, a head of steam uh, in the electorate in Scotland that a lot of these proposals, proposals are implemented, um, you know, those that are agreed sooner rather than later. So I'm just wondering if you can talk us through uh, this particular aspect of your paper and what kind of time period you would be uh, talking about um, the, the phasing of any uh, additional devolved powers. Okay. Um, I think the, the challenge, Chairman, uh, in, in all of this is twofold. Uh, the first is that uh, we haven't had substantial tax devolution, um, except in respect of uh, local taxes since the Parliament was created. The Scottish Government uh, doesn't have, as yet, a substantial uh, Treasury capability. Um, it has Revenue Scotland, which is a very small organisation. Uh, the Scottish Government has yet uh, to learn the skill set. This is not a criticism, it's just an expression of how the world is. Uh, the skill set uh, of managing a budget in which has an income uh, which uh, might go up and down depending as the economy goes up and down, and uh, a world in which it has to manage cash flow through borrowing. Uh, so leaping to a situation in which uh, half of its budget uh, uh, was subject to that uh, constraint uh, seems to me to be quite risky. Um, uh, at the moment, if we implement the Scotland Act 2012, the Calman scheme, uh, that will mean approximately 30% of the revenue budget of the Parliament uh, is subject to that kind of challenge, and that is scheduled to be implemented in 2016. That seems to me uh, to be a sensible place to start. The second constraint is purely electoral, and uh, that is to say uh, if uh, an administration uh, uh, is to be formed in this parliament after an election, it's only reasonable uh, that people who are being elected to it have a manifesto which says how they're going to use the powers that they've got. So it's quite neat, actually, that in the, in the 20 elections of the 2016 Parliament, all of the parties here will have to take a view on what they will do with the Scottish income tax. Um, it's arguable uh, that we should do it in two chunks, therefore in 2016 and 2020. Um, I could be persuaded uh, that it could be done uh, more quickly than that, but the price would be that halfway through a Parliament, big new taxpayers would come uh, and the administration, whoever it was, uh, would exercise them uh, without uh, necessarily having had at manifesto authority to do so. So you're suggesting that, uh, that new powers that may be devolved as a result of a uh, Smith Commission deliberations shouldn't be implemented in 2016? Okay, One is to go with the 2016 bundle, and the Scotland Act 2012, and implement the Smith proposals after that. Uh, or secondly, to, um, to amend the 2016 bundle in the light of whatever Smith recommends. In either case, I would think it was prudent to do it in stages. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to open up the session now. And the first uh, colleague to ask questions was Michael, to be followed by Malcolm. Thank you, uh, um, 
the issue of uh, welfare devolution. Uh, the, the convener uh, explores some of, of those issues, and in your paper you, you comment on the analogy with Northern Ireland. Um, so I hope to explore that a bit. They have the, the principle of parity. Uh, do you support that principle? Because uh, the present time, from what I'm, my reading, is that for the first time Northern Ireland has made a change uh, to the, the welfare system. They're refusing to, to rule out universal uh, credit and not to take the bedroom tax. That has led to the UK government having to provide the Northern Ireland Assembly with a £100 million pound uh, loan which has to be paid back. Uh, is that the type of practical difficulty you could see developing here if we go along with that analogy? Well, um, uh, that's a, that's a, a, a good question, Mr McMahon, because it illustrates exactly uh, the issue here. Um, it, it, the, let's um, first of all understand the, the Northern Ireland system. For reasons of history, which go back before 1923, uh, welfare, the, the welfare system is devolved in Northern Ireland. Uh, the so-called principle of parity uh, is that so long as the Northern Ireland administration do exactly what the UK welfare system does, the Treasury will cough up exactly what the amount of money is needed. Now, in a sense, that's uh, what I would say is the principle which should underlie any welfare devolution in respect to Scotland. That is, uh, that the UK social security net sets a floor and the Scottish Parliament should be able, if it wishes and can raise the money, uh, to supplement that. Uh, the only question in my view is whether that is supplementing it on uh, individual identified benefits, housing benefit, or whether it's, a, as it were, a general power of supplementation. I can see arguments uh, in either direction. Uh, what's happening at the moment, of course, in Northern Ireland um, is that um, uh, the, some of the parties, at least in the administration, want to have their cake and eat it. Uh, uh, they want to have the devolved power, uh, but are unwilling to find the money uh, uh, to exercise it. In particular, I think they, understandably, uh, uh, don't want to implement the bedroom tax, uh, but they're unwilling to make any cut elsewhere in their budget uh, in order to do that. And of course, they don't have any meaningful tax powers that would enable them to pay for it through taxation. Now, this... Um, uh, it illustrates the issue, I think, quite neatly. Uh, the, and this Parliament has done, made certain measures, which I think, if I've got it right now, will more or less completely remove the uh, effect of the bedroom tax, but it has taken a hit elsewhere in its spending programmes. Under the proposals which I would support, it would have the choice of taking the hit elsewhere in its spending programmes or increasing its tax income in order to do so. Does that help you? So, yeah. Uh, it clarifies exactly the, the position of the options that would that would be available when we, when we take this. No in any of this, guys. No, uh, that, that's the bottom line. Because we've we've heard the evidence from other uh, experts uh, who've, who've spoken about this issue, who who have said you, you have to bear in mind that the idea of bringing devolved powers to Scotland doesn't necessarily mean that it means better or improved or fairer. No, uh, no, no. Uh, uh, the constitution is a means towards an end. It doesn't. It produces neither more money nor fairer outcomes nor greener country. One of the things that, that is pursued as a policy in order to try and create fairness is the minimum wage. Do you have any concerns over the minimum wage being devolved or the setting of the minimum wage in Scotland being devolved? I would favour a UK-wide minimum wage. Uh, I would favour that because there's always a risk here uh, uh, of a race to the bottom uh, with, uh, between one region and another. And if it were not uh, a UK-wide minimum wage, I think that the um, pressure in the South East for a higher minimum wage there uh, might put Scotland at a disadvantage. Okay, that's very clear. Thanks, uh, Jamie. I was interested in the whole of, well, all of it, but <coughs> page two of your submission <coughs> on the, the, the balance of um, resources from taxation and resources from grant, and you said, in my view, should be one of broad equivalence. I mean, I, I mean, how flexible are you on that? I suppose, I mean, a lot of the discussion now obviously is uh, people, you know, how much we should be responsible for of our revenue, and you dismiss the idea we should be responsible for all of it, but, I mean, are you, would you take a hard line on 50%? What about 75%? What would be the objection to that? Um, it, there is no magic number here, um, but there are some numbers that are clearly out of order. 
Um, it depends, on, obviously, on the scale of spending, first of all, Mr. Chisholm. Obviously, if the Parliament's uh, budget were increased substantially to take on some new responsibility, it would be a lot harder to get to 75% and than it would if the Parliament's budget were at its present level. I think the principled question that we have to focus on, and I, I, I'm glad you've raised this because uh, it seems to me to be an issue which has been neglected in the Scottish debate, uh, is once again uh, we are in within the United Kingdom in a system in which there is both risk sharing and social solidarity. And the risk sharing and social solidarity apply entirely, if you like, in respect to reserved services, uh, notably social security, and partially in respect of devolved services. That is to say uh, that the budget of this parliament uh, should, in my view, as a matter of principle, uh, be partly met from resources shared across the whole UK and partly met from resources under the control of this institution itself. This is entirely common worldwide. One looks across federal systems, uh, you see almost without exception that there is this so-called vertical fiscal gap. And there are good reasons for it. It's not simply an accident of history or, or foot dragging by the central government. Uh, there are good economic reasons for it and there are good social reasons for it. Now, uh, what's the right number? Um, and 9010 is not the right number in either direction, uh, because uh, if it's 90% grant, then uh, the United Kingdom government is essentially determining the budget of this parliament. Conversely, if it's 10% grant, then the public services on which Scotland's, Scots rely are going to be wholly dependent, uh, or almost wholly dependent, uh, on uh, Scottish tax revenue. And that would be both risky and, in my view, uh, in the long run, disadvantageous uh, to Scotland. Uh, is it uh, anywhere between 60 and 40 seems to me to be reasonable. I think, as a matter of judgment, I think 75 is pushing it a bit. Uh, one reason I think 75 is pushing it a bit um, is that uh, if the fiscal transfer from the United Kingdom Parliament were 20 or 30 per cent of the total budget of this institution, it would become swiftly very evident that the relative spending lead, which Scotland currently enjoys in relation to devolved services, was almost entirely met by a grant from the Westminster government. I think that would be tactically unwise. Well, that's an interesting point at the end. Yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the risk from shortfalls that's your main concern, is it? Indeed, we're, we're talking about risk sharing and risk sharing in respect of public services, notably, but not only health and education. So that the, at my view is that the services such as those on which people depend and which are regarded rightly uh, as social rights should not be wholly at risk uh, from uh, long-term or indeed short-term fluctuations in Scottish tax revenue. It's a question of balance. You, you mentioned just in passing VAT cannot be devolved, but a share of its yield could be assigned. Um, do, you, do you have a strong view on that? It doesn't sound as if uh, I, I, I'm, on balance, I am disinclined to assign, uh, but there are those, um, and we certainly be members of the committee, who take the view that um, maximising the number of its own resources is an objective in itself, and if you regard that as an objective, you could achieve it by assigning a share of VAT. But let me um, just remind you of the risks involved in that. This is all a balance of risk and reward. The risk involved in assigning a share of VAT uh, is that you take the revenue fluctuations, VAT goes up and down as the economy goes up and down, but you do not, because you cannot have any of the tax rate tools to manage those fluctuations. So if VAT falls, um, uh, the Parliament would be unable to increase the rate to increase its income. Uh, I would rather give the Parliament a power to rely on a tax which it could influence uh, rather than a tax on which it was simply a price taker. But, it, but is there not an argument for having a mix of taxes? I suppose a situation that I've been thinking about just recently, it hadn't occurred to me until recently, is you know if you've, if you've got all or a substantial part of income tax, but none of VAT, you, you then have a, a risk 
in terms of the behaviour of the UK government, although um, my own party has pledged not to increase VAT. We know the Conservative Party in the past has increased VAT in order to keep income tax down. And if the UK Parliament raised VAT and cut income tax, would that not create a difficulty for the Scottish Parliament because we, we couldn't um, cut income tax without affecting our public services and therefore Scottish taxpayers would have the disadvantage of having to pay the higher rate of income tax plus the higher rate of VAT? No, I don't think so. Um, obviously, that depends on the grant mechanism, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly the grant mechanism uh, as currently uh, operated and as I would envisage it operating uh, would not carry that risk. Uh, the interesting question, um, uh, VAT is a UK tax uh, and uh, it must be a UK tax under EU law uh, and there are good economic arguments why that should be so, it's all about uh, tax competition. Uh, if VAT were increased, UK tax revenue uh, would increase. Uh, that would feed through into this Parliament's share of UK tax revenue through the Barnett formula, uh, and therefore it would be open to this Parliament either to maintain its devolved taxes or to decrease them. Well, I mean, I'm not sure if that is the case, because surely it's the total tax that matters. I mean, the UK Parliament could keep its taxation at the same level, but just change the balance between VAT and income tax, and there would then and be indeed, no advantage. Uh, and indeed, uh, you, and you're right to raise that, uh, Mr. Chisholm. Of course, that's the point I was making uh, when I began to talk about the conditions for the devolution of income tax. Uh, they include ensuring that the Barnett formula can continue, mm -hmm. uh, but appropriately, uh, so that those risks uh, do not uh, emerge. And uh, there are ways of doing that. Uh, but it would require a bit of algebra, which I cannot um, write in the air for you. OK, moving on to welfare. I mean, um, this general power of supplementation, again, do you, I mean, you illustrated it from housing benefit, but I suppose, I mean, are you open-minded or positive about that being extended to a much wider range, obviously not pensions, but to a much wider range of Social Security benefits? Uh, eh, yes, in principle. I think one has to be um, quite uh, careful and work one's way through the long list. Um, the, the obvious benefit uh, in this context is universal credit, uh, which uh, I think is the one that um, most people would consider for supplementation. Um, uh, benefits can be divided uh, helpfully into two classes. Uh, those which are cyclical, which would include universal credit, uh, and those which are not cyclical. Uh, which would include attendance allowance, uh, disability living allowance and some other uh, benefits. It's actually easier to devolve the second category uh, into the Scottish budget because the Scottish budget typically does not include cyclical items. Uh, so I would be, uh, personally, my, my preference actually uh, would be to take a, a big benefit and devolve it, like housing benefit, uh, because that uh, enables the Scottish Parliament to play uh, to play tunes, as it were, uh, particularly in respect of housing, uh, because um, the reason housing benefit is so big um, is because during the 1980s, the then government decided to transfer resources from bricks and mortar provision of housing into cash provision of housing support. Uh, the complete devolution of housing benefit uh, would give the parliament the opportunity, if it wished, to take a different view and say, actually, for some people, it would be better we provided houses rather than provided rental support. But on the other hand, I can see the argument uh, that a wider power of supplementation uh, is simpler to operate uh, and would enable the Parliament uh, to say collectively, uh, if the people of Scotland believe this, uh, we would rather that uh, poor people in our society were better supported uh, and that people who pay taxes paid a bit more tax. Um, obviously, if that were the policy of the Parliament, uh, that would be a decision which it then could make. Sorry, per perhaps I misunderstood you, but I, I, I thought from your paper you were talking about housing benefit when you went on to talk about the Northern Ireland system, so I assumed you were slightly cagey about having the full... Well, uh, no, I think, I think uh, Mr. Jism, I, I would take the view, if you go for the supplementation, uh -huh. uh, essentially it's on universal credit, either all of universal credit yeah, or the housing uh -huh. element of universal credit. I suppose that if you're going for supplementation, you should do all of universal credit. Um, I certainly wouldn't do it in respect to pensions, because I think that's a key element of UK uh, social solidarity. But in terms of, I mean, the traditional argument for devolving housing benefit, which I've supported for a long time, then that, that 
that really would require much more fundamental changes. I mean, if you were going to shift the, the spend onto housing supply rather than housing Indeed. benefit, um, that, could that work with supplementation? Or? No, well, it wouldn't work with supplementation. No, no. That's an alternative. Yeah, it would yeah. be to carve housing benefit out of universal oh. credit, uh, make mm -hmm. it the responsibility of this Parliament, have a funding arrangement mm -hmm. under which the UK uh, guarantees to provide an annually managed expenditure uh, what housing benefit would have cost, which mm -hmm. is a slightly technical calculation, uh, but the Parliament then has the opportunity uh, to uh, use that flow of income either in the form of direct cash mm -hmm. uh, or of uh, bricks and mortar. Um, I don't think uh, we're going to move into a world in which uh, we'd go back to, as it were, mass provision mm -hmm. of housing, because that would... Um, uh, that would cost a great deal more. Mm. But there are certainly groups of people who receive housing benefit for whom uh, more direct provision of housing uh, would be a much, much better option. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Malcolm. Jamie, to be followed by Jean. I want to convene a Professor Gallagher. Uh, and your paper, when I read your paper, <coughs> I thought you seemed very cautious about the devolution of income tax. But did I pick you up right when you said to the are actually subject to things being ironed out, some of the issues you, you pick up, and you, you're actually in favour of it. Now, uh, what I said in the paper is that uh, there's a list of really quite serious issues that I would think would require to be properly addressed before all of income tax could be devolved. I think, to be honest, one of them is unfixable, and that is the um, question of uh, redistribution and, and sharing. And uh, what I said to the chairman is um, that... If this Parliament wanted to argue for the complete devolution of income tax, it should do so with its eyes open and not for, if I may be blunt, simply ideological reasons, whatever power we, want, whatever power we can get, we should grab. Okay? Well, I, I get that. That yeah. came through in your paper, but I thought you said to the convener you uh, uh, are in favour of it. Uh, if the issues, which the other issues which I have addressed, uh, uh, um, uh, mentioned have been addressed, that is to say uh, the uh, dealing with this problem of English t votes for English taxes. Second, uh, ensuring that the Barnett formula I is uh, sustained and retained, but in a way which doesn't either unfairly advantage or disadvantage Scotland. And I give you the examples of how it might, it might do uh, the unfair advantage, but let's just think for a moment about the unfair disadvantage. Let's imagine that income tax were completely devolved. Uh, but that a government in the United Kingdom uh, decided to cut income tax uh, because it decided that a much better way of providing uh, health would be to charge 50 quid every time you visited the GP. Uh, income tax would go down and health spending would go down. Uh, health spending going down would reduce the Barnet consequential to the Scottish government from health, but income tax in Scotland wouldn't have gone down. Now, that would be an unacceptable consequence. So that set of issues would need to be fixed before income tax could be devolved. OK. And you said in the context of it being involved, I think, a picture of it, you would still uh, think it would make sense for HMRC to be the collection body. Yes. But you did also make the point that there are issues about their capacity to collect just now, primarily a resourcing issue. Well, I think the chairman made those points, yes. OK, I, th I thought you were accepting them. But uh, isn't there also an issue here in terms of uh, if we're dealing with a devolved function, how can we, uh, say the Finance Committee specifically, how could we seek to hold HMRC to account when they're not a creature of statute emanating from this place in the same way that Revenue Scotland does? Do you, do you think that could be an issue? Uh, I'm, I think we addressed this, if I remember right, uh, in the Calman report, because, of course, under the Scotland Act 2012, HMRC collects the Scottish income tax and remits it here. Uh, and there should be, uh, and I think that maybe, I'm, I'm, I have looked at the legislation recently, a line of direct accountability from HMRC for its performance in collecting Scottish income tax in the way there's a line of accountability uh, for its collection of UK taxes. Now, um, my recollection, and I'm now well beyond um, my recent history in this, Mr Hepburn, is that uh, the Revenue uh, Commissioners designated one of their number as the uh, as it were, Scottish uh, Commissioner for this purpose. But I may be wrong in that now. It's a wee while since I looked at it. I suppose maybe accountability was maybe the wrong, I mean, the wrong term. I'm yeah. just thinking more in terms of if we as a parliament identified the need for legislative change for the 
uh, for tax collection, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to implement that uh, in relation to HMRC, would we? Because we could for a, a devolved body. Yeah, if you devolve the tax completely, as you've done with stamp duty, you can completely change the structure and you can whip Revenue Scotland if they don't do a good job and you can change their powers, yes. Um, my view uh, is that, um, for the reasons I explained to the Chairman earlier, that is to say both employers and employees will benefit from a single UK income tax framework. And one of the things that um, it's important to remember about income tax, and I, you may well have had HMRC in front of you, and if, they, if you had, I'm sure they would have said this, so forgive me if I repeat it. Income tax is unusual among taxes uh, in that the state doesn't collect most of it. Employers collect it. Uh, and any changes uh, to income tax uh, impact very heavily on employers. And many employers, of course, are cross-border employers. So the maximum um, uh, coherence in the tax base and tax administration is, I think, that's something to be achieved if you can get it. Okay. T t turning to welfare, I'm, yeah. uh, as uh, Mr McMahon is, uh, I'm on the Welfare Reform Committee. We had mm -hmm. a discussion about the whole area of further devolution at our yeah. meeting yesterday and the, uh, the parity principle in relation to Northern Ireland was mm -hmm. well discussed. I won't uh, rehearse that again, although I will, will point out Professor Spicker, who was giving uh, us evidence, mm -hmm. he felt that by its very nature that would be an appropriate model for devolution because he thinks that would be incompatible with uh, the terms of the Smith Commission, who are set up to, divine, to deliver a substantial uh, devolution. Uh, but on a more uh, specific point, he also uh, raised the uh, prospect of uh, this part being able to uh, create new forms of support through uh, the social security system, mm -hmm. which presently we're, um, uh, we're not able to do. That's a reserve matter under the Scotland Act. <coughs> and of course, you are well aware he gave the example, he wasn't advocating it, he just posed it as an example and you say we wanted to create a funeral uh, grant, you know, right now mm -hmm. we wouldn't be able to, to do that. If there was to be uh, some form of devolution, you're talking about being able to supplement the existing social security system, do you think it would be sensible that the, this parliament should have the leeway to look at other forms of support that aren't presently established? Um, one way of looking at uh, the answer to that question, uh, uh, Mr Burnett, and I, my reaction is not wholly negative to it, um, uh, is to realise that, of course, uh, support uh, comes in different forms today. Um, but the way we've divided uh, the uh, welfare state uh, in this country uh, post-evolution is that what would be called redistributive forms of welfare are largely reserved, that's to say cash benefits, but distributive forms of welfare, the provision of services, is largely devolved. Uh, but of course, uh, in all of these cases, there's, there's a boundary in which there can be a choice made between the provision of a service and the provision of cash. Uh, so the Parliament already has many powers which, in effect, uh, enable it to supplement UK benefits. So, to, uh, and I'll come, I will come back to the detailed uh, point that you make in a moment, uh, but let me give you an example of that today. Um, uh, attendance allowance is a cash benefit, uh, which is intended uh, to enable an elderly person who needs uh, help at home to pay for attendance, uh, whereas, of course, this Parliament already provides personal care free. Uh, so uh, I think the principle of allowing this institution uh, to provide supplements uh, is not absolutely wrong. Uh, and I wouldn't wholly rule out the idea that the supplementation uh, could be in the form of um, as it were, an addition that isn't simply altering the rate of an existing benefit. Uh, I think there are two challenges, however. Uh, one is administrative. Um, creating a whole new bureaucracy to do that would obviously be daft. Uh, but um, uh, the challenge of um, uh, inviting the DWP to create a whole new set of beneficiaries only for Scotland, that might be administratively very expensive for them and therefore uh, for the Parliament. So, uh, in principle, I think that might be conceivable. It's a short answer, but it's not wholly straightforward. Well, I suppose I would observe where the functions have been devolved thus far, albeit on a very limited basis. The, the parliament, the government have chosen not to go via the DWP. They've worked in partnership primarily with local authorities. So there is a model that could work, I suppose. Yes, there is. And, of course, that, those powers already exist. Um, if you look in the Social Work Scotland Act of 1968, uh, local authorities have the power to give cash payments uh, in the welfare uh, mode already. 
uh, and um, I think you will find that uh, uh, if you had the money and the imagination, uh, you could probably use those powers in many of the ways in which I suspect you might like to. Uh, on a related issue, and again, that came up uh, the Welfare Reform Committee, and uh, Mr. Mann has explored it. Maybe I didn't hear you correctly, and I've maybe written it down, but I thought I heard you say that the pressure for, in relation to the, uh, the devolution of the minimum wage, you said that the pressure for a higher minimum wage in the southeast of England could put Scotland at a disadvantage. Well, I don't uh, understand. If you had a geographically case. variable minimum wage, uh, uh, the economic pressure would be to have it higher uh, in areas where wages are in general higher. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's the South East. But that, that, I mean, it's already the case that wages are higher there. So that's right. But uh, why, uh, well, why, why, the people who understand why that would put us at if, a disadvantage, and presumably, if it's devolved, then we can set a, a minimum wage as we see fit for Scottish circumstances? Well, the economic effects of that are quite interesting, of course. My, 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 I think I still take the view uh, that if you're talking about um, so we're regional competition on wages, um, uh, the, there is a risk of having a variable minimum wage that you get regional competition in a downward, not an upward direction. It might not always be you that was setting the minimum wage. Probably never, never would be, be, but that's another never be. There we are. <laughs> the point entirely. Um, okay, and um, my last uh, question, uh, convener, uh, relates to uh, oil taxation uh, or oil and gas mm -hmm. taxation. Uh, so, sorry, sorry, which taxation? Oil, uh, oil, oil and gas, gas yes, uh, taxation. Sorry. You uh, make the point that uh, oil taxation is as a natural resource rent, easy in principle to decentralise and that was a point made by uh, Professor McLean to this committee Indeed. and the Chartered Institute of Taxation made that point to the Treasury Select Committee down south. You do seem to be against it and I'm just wondering you know, wh how do other countries of Scotland's size with significant oil and gas interests, possibly more significant, as how do they cope with this burden? Uh, mostly, but not only, in other countries. Um, oil taxation is grabbed, as it were, as a national rather than a regional resource. There are some exceptions to that. Uh, and in some places, um, it's a resource which is shared between the different levels of government. Alberta would be an example in Canada. There are different ways of dealing with it in Nigeria. Um, economic theory pulls in two different directions. Uh, the first, the taxation theory, says, well, um, you should really tax stuff that doesn't move around at a, a, a sub-national level or a sub-state level. Oil doesn't move around, therefore you should tax it at a sub-state level. And that's the argument that the Chartered Institute of Taxation and Professor McLean was taking. Uh, the second uh, economic argument actually points in the opposite direction, and you'll see it explained in the expert group uh, which uh, advised the Calment Commission on oil taxation. And that is uh, that uh, windfall taxes have an economic effect, an inflationary economic effect, if you like, and that should be spread over a wide rather than a narrow area. Um, but I don't think that's the decision. Uh, either of those is the basis on which a decision should be made about the devolution of oil taxation in Scotland. Uh, the decision is quite a simple one. Um, if your objective is to cut Scottish public spending, then you should devolve oil taxation. If your objective is not to cut Scottish public spending, then you should reserve oil taxation. The choice, of course, would be for the Parliament to argue for one or the other. But given that there are sub-state jurisdictions that have control over their natural resources, and given that there are countries that are of a similar size to Scotland that seem to cope very well with uh -huh, yeah. having this. I mean, I use the term burden somewhat in an obtuse nature. I don't happen to view oil and gas as a burden, but given that they can manage it, you know, why couldn't Scotland? Um, if what, you're, what's, the, uh, I repeat, what's the Scottish exceptionalism here? The Scottish exceptionalism is quite simple. Um, if your objective is to uh, tie devolved spending to a revenue source which is in long-term decline and therefore put spending in long-term decline, that's, if I may say so, an ideological rather than a practical view. Oil and gas revenues hit their peak some years ago now. Typically, a big, a good year for oil was 11 or 12 billion pounds of revenue, of which probably 85 or 90 percent would have fallen within what would become Scottish territorial waters. At the moment, oil revenue is around 3 billion a year. 
uh, with oil prices being low. Uh, it is, of course, volatile. It depends on how oil prices go up and down. But it, it is, on any view, in long-term decline. If we were to say today, let us devolve oil tax revenue, uh, and let us say that it financed £3 billion pounds of the Parliament's present budget, what we would be saying is that in 20 years, either we'd have to find another source of tax revenue equal to £3 billion, pounds, or we'd have to cut this Parliament's budget by £3 billion. Pounds. That's just the arithmetic of it. It's not, it's not actually an economic question, it's a practical one. No, but the point I'm making is surely this is a challenge that isn't unique to Scotland, so what, what makes us the exception? What why can these other jurisdictions manage it and we can't? Well, um, if you have... Uh, this, of course, is a challenge for the UK. Um, oil revenue is declining at a UK level. Um, at the moment, uh, those revenues uh, in 20 or 30 or maybe 40 years' time uh, will be vanishingly close to zero. The UK is more easily able to manage that because £3 billion of revenue is relatively small in the total UK tax revenues, which, off the top of my head, are six or seven hundred billion, aren't they? Uh, whereas in re relation to Scotland, and in particular in relation to the uh, funding of this Parliament, uh, three billion pounds is about five percent, sorry, ten percent, it's five percent of total Scottish spending, and it's five percent, ten percent of the budget of this Parliament. This is just a question of scale and arithmetic. So I repeat, and if your objective is to cut Scottish public spending, uh, by all means, uh, tie the budget of this Parliament to oil revenues. <laughs> okay, uh, Jamie, uh, Jean to be followed by Gavin. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, convener. Uh, Professor Gallagher, did you think devolution was a good idea? Yes. Good. And uh, when you talk in your paper about uh, uh, full fiscal autonomy yes. and, and what that means, uh, you have in one paragraph a statement, uh, this too is inconsistent with the promises made to the voters. Um, what were the promises made to the voters, in okay. your opinion? In my opinion, um, well, not my opinion, um, it seems to me uh, that what was on offer uh, in the referendum campaign, and, and, and you're right, Ms. Urquhart, to uh, uh, so locate this debate, uh, 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 this question of further powers of the Parliament uh, in the wider constitutional space. Uh, the, problems, the, the promises made to the voters during the campaign can be summarised, if you like, uh, uh, crudely, in pensions and barnet. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Uh, they are both questions of social solidarity. Promises made to the voters were, first, uh, that if they remained in the UK, uh, they would have the benefit uh, uh, or the um, security uh, of a common social security system, pooled risk, notably in relation to old age pensions. And that, as it were, stands simple. Uh, of a principle of social solidarity in respect of uh, what I earlier called redistributive benefits. The second promise they were made, if you like, was that there would be a Barnett formula, and that in, its, in, a, in the same way stands simple for saying that there would be social solidarity in the provision of public services, including those public services which are devolved to this Parliament, notably health and education. In other words, uh, the, as I was explaining to the Chairman earlier, my view is that the budget of this Parliament should not be solely dependent on Scottish revenues, but should be partly dependent on Scottish revenues and partly dependent on a share of United Kingdom revenues. And that is why I think that as a matter of principle, uh, the question of full fiscal autonomy, either, uh, as I put it in the paper, in the guise of all public spending in Scotland being determined uh, by Scottish revenues only, or indeed uh, all of the budget of this Parliament uh, being funded solely by own resources or Scottish revenues is inconsistent with what was offered to the voters. Okay. Um, can you suggest uh, any taxes where the, where the devolved Scottish Parliament uh, might ask to, to uh, have power over that would allow them to genuinely make a difference? In other words, uh, what would be the position of the Scottish Parliament in terms of raising taxes that would not affect the Barnett formula, that wouldn't be levelled out, um, as the 
taxes that we're, cur we're cu are currently devolved. What, other than, in other words, other than the paper here, which is largely about tax, what powers could the Scottish government be given, in your opinion? Do you have any, any suggestions of powers right. that the, the Scottish government... Sorry, I, I, I'm not quite sure I follow the question. Do you mean powers other than tax powers? Or powers to, to raise other taxes other than those which uh, are currently... Uh, right, OK. Um, ..across the Union. Let, let me... Um, it, that's quite a hard question. Uh, let's start with the understanding that the spending powers of the Scottish Parliament are by international standards unusually wide. Okay? If you look at devolved or systems or federal systems typically worldwide, uh, you will see that the proportion of spending devolved in Scotland is higher uh, than the proportion of spending devolved to state-level governments in most federal systems. Uh, people uh, tend to blink uh, uh, when you say that, but uh, the data, OECD data, OECD data uh, tell you that very clearly. And the reason for that is that the Parliament was built on a long history uh, of, of decentralisation and administrative devolution, uh, uh, which is one of the reasons uh, why I have, um, to go back to your first question, always supported devolution. So the scope for additional uh, chunks of spending that, that might be decentralised is, in my view, quite limited. We're back into the question of welfare, and that seems to me to be primarily uh, a matter which is, going back to my earlier point, about UK social solidarity. Um, are there, uh, as it were, relatively small additional powers? Yes, there might be. I mean, I'm quite in favour of um, finding some way of decentralising at least some of the powers of the Crown Estate Commissioners, for example, to refer to an area I know you're interested in. And as far as taxes are concerned, um, well, worldwide, um, uh, governments are looking for things to tax, and they've probably found most of the things you can tax. Uh, if there were more, they'd find them. Uh, but I do think that the Scottish Parliament uh, should have uh, the power to uh, tax additional things uh, if it wants to. I mean, it's subject to them not being uh, you know, completely distorting uh, uh, of the rest of the UK economy. Well, so that's as much as I can say, really, in, uh, I mean, in one, answer to that. One potential tax might be a land tax. Yes, actually. Of and course, that's already tax. within the Parliament's powers. So okay. you would see that as... Well, as a matter of principle, I mean, one of the, your earlier session, uh, you, now you're on to one of my obsessions here, so if you've got a while, um, uh, one of the... Uh, you had an earlier session on stamp duty land tax, as I, I think that's what your, the previous witnesses were on about. Um, now, all, or virtually all, all but one of the taxes which affect real property in Scotland are now devolved to this Parliament. Okay? Uh, there are only three. Uh, there is... Uh, Stamp duty land tax, which are transaction tax on property, and non-domestic rates, which are tax on the enjoyment of non-domestic property, and there's council tax, which is a tax on the enjoyment of domestic property. You've got them all. The only, uh, the only tax which affects real property which is not decentralised uh, is capital gains tax on, on transactions involving real property, and that's tied up uh, with capital gains tax more generally. Now, um, I think that uh, the Scottish Government's proposals on stamp duty land tax are a step forward, which is good. But I'm disappointed that they didn't take the opportunity to look at the taxation of land and property in the round, because all those powers are here today. And it seems to me to be a wee bit of a failure of imagination. Uh, what I would do, uh, I'm perfectly plain, is move in gradual steps uh, towards a land value tax. First thing I would do uh, is make an assessment of the extent to which the existing property taxes approximate to it. And actually, non-domestic rates are not that far away from a land value tax, and they're paid every year. Council tax is pretty hopeless. Um, no one's revalued for... Uh, 50, I can't think how many years, since 1991. Thank you. That's quite a while, isn't it? <laughs> uh, so uh, there may well be a case for a revaluation or another look at council tax. But the long-term objective is that this Parliament already has the powers uh, to look at the taxation of land and real property and should take a deep breath and think very hard about it. Don't need any new powers to do that. Uh, just as a uh, secondary question to that, you, you don't see any issue in terms of the kind of 
endless debate about not wanting to upset any apple cart in terms of competition or movement of business. I mean, you cited the, the, the minimum wage, uh, which I would disagree with you about, but um, there, there would be no issue with that. In addition to land tax, no, because land doesn't move around. In terms of other developments, so you had the, the, the four uh, evidence givers earlier today who talked about a half a percent making a difference. Ah. Um, in the long run, taxations on land influence the value of land. Okay. And, and finally, just, uh, just to ask you about this, uh, the business of, of tax collection and... Yes. Um, I mean, you, in your submission, there's a, you do refer to national insurance contributions. Yes. Um, but... Uh, Collecting national insurance contributions is just really collecting income tax, is it not? No, nope. um, for two reasons. Um, one, that national insurance falls into two halves. One is a payroll tax, an employer's tax, uh, which is, um, I've forgotten the numbers now, I don't, I don't have them with me, no doubt uh, the committee has access to them. So the payroll tax is one part of it. Uh, second, um, it's not like income tax in that it's not a progressive tax. See, regressive tax. It's a payment, as it were, for membership of the social security system. Well, sorry, I, I, I'll stop you there. It's not that I don't understand the, the, yeah. the basis of calculation of the tax, mm -hmm. but but where does it end up? It doesn't. You know, people used to imagine that the your national insurance was was going to pay your pension. There was some kind of fund that you might well, there is uh, a fund make a contribution to, but in fact, the income tax and national insurance, once collected regardless of how they're calculated or whether their employer's contribution or the employee's contribution actually end up in the same bucket? Well, uh, all income tax in the end flows into the Treasury and all national insurance in the end flows into the Treasury because the National Insurance Fund is not big enough uh, to uh, carry the resources on it. It's not a fund. Uh, it's not a funded fund in the sense like a, a, a company pension fund. Um, uh, I could give you a long story about why Lord George failed to do that in 1923, but I, I won't bore you with that. Um, I think the interesting thing, uh, there are three interesting things about national insurance as respects um, uh, the potential devolution of it. First, I think um, uh, there is a real principled question about it being, uh, as it were, a payment for membership, if you like, uh, of the UK welfare state. It's an uh, it's a gateway into the pension. And people talk about their stamps still. Do you have enough stamps to get the full pension? I think that's important. So I think the contributory principle is one that we uh, uh, ditch at our peril. Uh, second, I think the payroll, as it were, the payroll element of it, well, one can, you can run an argument that says, oh, perhaps we should decentralise that or allow it to be varied in some way. And then there's a third element, which is the percentage element, uh, which um, uh, is, in a sense, a substitute income tax is now 2% on income above a certain level. It's £40,000, uh, as it were, forever. Uh, but the other thing that's worth remembering, uh, which people often forget about national insurance, is that quite a lot of people with substantial income do not pay it, notably people who are in receipt of pensions. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, do you think that there's, there's areas of improvement on tax collection generally? Do you think there's I an opportunity? I don't claim to be an expert on that, I'm afraid, Ms. I, I, it's pretty. It's interesting that um, uh, the revenue can put a number on the amount of tax they don't collect. I imagine uh, if they had more resource or more power, they could collect more of it, but there would be a trade-off, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I, but I wouldn't claim to have expertise on that. But, and in your enthusiasm for devolution, would you see that there was an opportunity for Scotland to, to design a different kind of uh, tax well, I think system? I, Given you my view on that earlier, I think that there is a strong argument for a single UK administrative system for income tax uh, for the benefit of both employers and employees. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Gavin, to followed by John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Gavin, hi. could you share with the Committee for the Record your views on corporation tax? I'm not in favour of the devolution of corporation tax. Um, I can see uh, the argument, you know, as it were, as a as an economic development tool. Um, I could give you the strong, the, the long reason why not, or the short reason why not, uh, and the short reason why not is Amazon and Google. Right? Um, uh, the trouble with corporation tax is that it is a tax on profits, and profits are not like land. 
uh, land doesn't move about, but profits can be moved around at the touch of a button. And those companies like Amazon and Google, which route all their profits through low-tax countries, are in effect uh, uh, avoiding, perfectly legally, but nevertheless irritatingly, uh, tax which would fall. And I don't think it would be in the interest of people in the UK as a whole, or in the long run, of people in Scotland to create uh, such tax competition opportunities inside the UK. Yeah, thank you. Um, you talked about air passenger duty. I think in response, I think it was in response to the convener's questioning. Um, I think you said you're, you're broadly in favour of that to be devolved, but you did have a caveat, which I can't read my writing, but it's something to do with predatory. As long yes, as there was no predatory, well, could you uh, expand on what, what you mean by the, the caveat? About Newcastle. <laughs> okay, Newcastle Airport is uh, in competition in some respects uh, with the airports in Scotland. And the worry that people there have, and I've got a lot of sympathy with them, uh, is that the Scottish Parliament uh, could take a little bit off air passenger duty, or maybe even a lot off air passenger duty. Uh, and the, the few flights that they've managed to get uh, that go outside the UK, I think they've just managed to secure one to New York, uh, uh, would immediately go to Edinburgh or Glasgow to save the 50 quid or whatever it was. So I, I mean, I've got some sympathy with that. So that's the, that's the, ess the essence of the issue, uh, the, the only issue that worries me about um, uh, your passenger duty. Okay. I just, I mean, uh, I take that point on board, but in, in terms of, you're, you're saying you'd be in favour of the devolution of it, you, you added in that caveat, but in, in practice, if, if you're saying you wouldn't want to see the Scottish Parliament reducing uh, air passenger duty by a by percentage point, what, how, how would you devolve it and add in the sort of caveat okay, that you're I, talking I, about? I, I understand the question. Um, I think the, uh, there are three things you might do. Um, one um, is that, as you will know, um, perhaps, uh, air passenger duty is already variable across the UK. Uh, the rates vary essentially on how far away you are from Heathrow, uh, and it's zero uh, in certain parts of Scotland already, in the Highlands and Islands. Uh, one could uh, devolve it on the basis that there was some change in the UK rate that might benefit Newcastle. That's one possibility. Another would be uh, to... Uh, uh, to do the opposite of what's happened in Ireland uh, and to devolve it for short haul rather than long haul flights. So uh, those are certainly possibilities. Um, in relation to VAT, yeah. your, your paper says uh, it can't be devolved, but a share of the yield could be assigned. Yeah. Uh, obviously, in your earlier answer, you pointed out the risks of so doing. But on, I mean, on balance, do you have a, do you have a view on whether... Uh, VAT should be assigned in part or in full, or have you just pointed? As out part of an overall package, uh, I would, I think, probably um, sign up to um, uh, an assignment of a number of percentage points of VAT. I'd just be careful uh, from the from the for the interests of this institution and indeed of people of Scotland uh, not to take on too much risk there. So I'd be cautious. I certainly wouldn't go above 10, and I might suggest go be going below that. Okay. Um, and really the last issue I wanted to ask about is more, is more theoretical, but I think Malcolm Chisholm asked about the, um, the broad equivalence, uh, yes. as, you, as you call in the paper, and uh, I think you give quite a useful answer there, is it either had to be 50-50 or 60-40. Somewhere around um, as, as the kind of ends of, yeah, of the spectrum yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. just, just from a theoretical point of view, though, we, we've had a number of witnesses who, who say, look, you know, look very carefully at that, because when you look at the figure, whether it's 50 or 40 or 60, some of it will be made up of a tax that is truly devolved, and some of it could be made up of a tax that's partially devolved, and some of it may well be assignation, where you've, you've got a share of the risk, but you can't yeah. control the rates at all. Do, do you have a... So they said, you know, there's, I suppose they, they were saying there's an extra dimension you really have to think of instead of just looking at the, the pure percentage, because on the OECD stuff, Germany, for example, they say, look, you might think uh, they've got a lot of control, but actually, in terms of the rates, um, there's not so much control. Do, do you have a view on, on how that 50-50 that should be made up? I mean, if it was theoretically only made up of taxes that were assigned and none of them were devolved... That's different from one well, word. Certainly wouldn't buy that deal. Yeah, yeah no, sorry. but I'm just, I'm just wondering what. Um, so it's obviously different from one where fifty percent yeah, is devolved. Okay. I just wonder, do you, do you have a view on, on that, the kind of balance, uh, that, how we ought to weigh that? That's up? quite an interesting question. Um, I, I would start, uh, Mr. Brown, by uh, agreeing that um, pure assignment gives all risk and no power. 
So you get, if you get VAT assigned, uh, your revenue goes up and down, uh, and short of long-term investment to grow the Scottish economy, there's not a lot you can do about it. Uh, um, therefore, uh, a, a deal which was pure assignment uh, would, be, would be the purest presentation, uh, and uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, may, I can understand that people um, take the view, um, it, it's a slightly um, superficial view, that this number really, really matters, and therefore um, we should put in some assignment to get to this number. And I can see the, actually the, genuinely the presentational argument for that. Um, in the end, my view on the 50-50-60-40 question is really about the amount of risk you're importing. Uh, and uh, I would be unhappy with importing 75% of risk into this budget, particularly as the only ways I can see of importing that uh, would, would be a lot of assignment, uh, which may risk and no additional power. Uh, conversely, I entirely accept uh, that 25% uh, uh, of our own resources really doesn't give the Parliament the power to do what I think the objective of all of this is, uh, which is while remaining inside the UK with the risk-sharing benefits and indeed the economic benefits of that, nevertheless to give the Parliament the opportunity to reflect a different approach to public services and taxation if that's what the people of Scotland want. Um, I, I may say, I, mean, I think only experiment will find out if that is indeed what the people of Scotland want, because it's very easy uh, to be in favour of increased public spending when you know you're not going to pay any increased taxes or you're not going to have to make the choice of increasing those taxes. I think it would be very good for, for this Parliament and it would be very good for the people of Scotland actually to have that choice and then make it one way or another. And I'm not sure what way they would make it. You know, we'll have to try it and see. Is that helpful? That's yeah. another topic. Convener. Uh, thanks, Convener. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gallagher, for persisting through all of this. Um, in, in some of your introductory kind of remarks, you talk quite a lot about the different kinds of union, political union, economic union, and you talk about it uh, respecting the outcome of the vote. Um, I mean, I think for me, I'm not entirely clear why everybody voted either yes or no, for that matter, but on, uh, concentrating on the no side, I mean, some don't even, you know, one or two people don't even want the Scottish Parliament to be here, so they voted no. Uh, some people want things to carry on as they are, so they voted no. Some people want a little bit more power, and some people want a lot more power, so it's quite difficult within that kind of mix, is it not, to discern really what the public wanted. Well, no doubt, but um, uh, was my idea to have a referendum? <laughs> so you get a result. Uh, and uh, the result was that it remained inside the United Kingdom. I think the best uh, way I, I, I have of, <coughs> uh, of answering that is uh, to look at what the campaigners offered in the end. But who knows my opinion? Uh, voters uh, are a bit like students. They like to answer the question they wish they had been asked, right? Uh, and lots of people voted uh, uh, no, yes uh, for reasons other than the uh, question in the exam paper. And we know this from other referendums. Uh, we know this from referendums in the European Constitution in France or in Ireland, for example. Uh, people were answering a different question. That's one of the risks of, of having a referendum. But nevertheless, the question was asked, and it has now been answered. Uh, and looking at, well... Uh, what promises were made, it seems to me, what commitments were made uh, on the basis that if you voted no, you get this? Well, uh, if you voted no, it was perfectly plain by definition that you were voting for a political union. You were voting for having a, uh, in my view, equal Scottish representation in Parliament at Westminster. When you say equal, could you expand on that? Because, uh, I mean, equal could mean we get 50% and England gets 50%, or equal could just mean... I'm a chartist in this respect. I think everybody's vote should have the equal effect. Right. right? Equal electoral person, districts. Right, okay. no. yeah. uh, and at the moment, we've almost got that. Not quite. Scotland is now, just by accident of history, slightly overrepresented in Westminster. Okay, so I first of all believe, therefore, that well, when people said we want to remain part of the UK, uh, the, uh, so the presenting question was one of political union. Uh, political union seems to me to be linked to two other forms of union, both of which were heavily debated during the campaign. Uh, the first is what I would call economic union, and the big symbolic issue in the campaign 
uh, was would we have a single currency or not after independence. It seems to me that the argument was made and accepted uh, that the maintenance of a single currency uh, outside of a political union uh, was at best perilous. So it seems to me the voters have voted for an economic union. And it I seems mean, again, could I just... Sorry to interrupt you, no, but no, I mean, w- would you accept there's a kind of range in there that it's not just kind of you've got a union... I mean, clearly you've got a currency or you don't. Yeah. But, I mean, in some of these words, union, I mean, you're either more united or less united, but you're probably never completely one union or you're never completely not one union. Um, well, so, uh, there are a number of ways of, um, as it were, analysing this concept of union. Um, if you look at the um, academic literature on this, I'm, uh, I'm going to sound a bit professor-like for a moment, um, there is, a, there is what's now a quite well-defined concept of a union state. Uh, and that is a state which has been formed from the union of pre-existing countries, but retains in its form some of the so our inheritance, the institutional inheritance of those pre-existing countries. And if you look at the union between Scotland and England uh, in 1707, it is precisely of that kind. Although there was political union in the creation of a single parliament, uh, there was the maintenance of something which actually mattered more to most people than the parliament, which was a separate church, as you will know, and also a separate legal system. And the legal system, of course, was at that time the only domestic instrument of the state. Uh, So uh, what we've got uh, in the United Kingdom and have always had, it seems to me, uh, is this form of union state in which Scotland has had a separate, distinct and continuing institutional identity. This wasn't invented in 1998 when this parliament was created. What this parliament did uh, was give that institutional identity, that historical continuity, a democratic aspect that was wholly appropriate uh, in the 20th century, should be perhaps appropriate even in the late 19th, but clearly wasn't relevant uh, in the 16th and 17th and the 18th. So uh, that's what we mean by union. That's one way of looking at it. The other way is to see in what respects does union operate. One is this political one. The second one is uh, economic. And the nature of the economic union is essentially a single domestic market. Free trade. That's what the 1707 people were after. And the Scots were in trouble in 1707 for two reasons. Uh, One, they were bankrupted because of the Darien scheme. uh, And two, because they had been frozen out of English markets by tariffs. And what 1707 created was what the Europeans would call a single market. And what's been created since then is a domestic market. Capital and goods, uh, uh, labour, uh, investment, uh, trade, all flow across the Scottish-English border without any let or hindrance. And there's a real contrast between that and the European market. And that's what makes a single currency sustainable, along with uh, the fiscal framework, uh, which involves the sharing of resources. And that sharing of resources is economically necessary. A fiscal union is necessary to make a currency union work. And it's also what gives effect to the third aspect of the union, which is a social union. Social solidarity, the sharing of resources first, uh, and perhaps most important in things like pensions and benefits, but also second in securing common social rights uh, such as health and education through a funding system that enables this parliament to do that, even if Scottish tax revenue falls through the floor. So on your final one of social union, yes. I mean, clearly, again, there is a range, isn't there? Because, a, you know, as, as you've said already, there's things like a free home care or personal care and that kind of thing, mm-hmm. which is slightly different. So there are already differences. It's not exactly the same. I mean, when, when people, if people voted for the social union, mm-hmm. do you think they actually voted that for all time their pensions should be the same as down south, or was it really a fear that their pensions might be poorer than down south? And in fact, if their pensions were better here, most people would be quite happy about that. They might. Um, I, that's a counterfactual. I don't know the answer to it. But what people certainly... Um, uh, it was pretty plain that of all of the issues that were around during the campaign, uh, securing a continued UK pension system was pretty near the top of the agenda. And one can see that in the voting patterns. Uh, And obviously, if you say to somebody, would you like your pension to be bigger, the answer would probably be yes. Um, If you say you would like it to be low, the answer would probably be no. Um, As a matter of pragmatism, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, 
if you look at the age structure of the Scottish population, it's very prudent to pull that risk at a UK level. I mean, at the moment, uh, Scotland, our, if you call it social protection, i.e. pensions and benefits together, is much the same proportion of our tax income or GDP as the rest of the UK's is. So at the moment, there's really no pulling going on. Well, that but goes are you back... arguing that there, in future there's a risk? So um, that's well, why we want to pull. Let me say, so that goes back to Mr Hepburn's question. Um, that's only true if you include the, G in, in the GDP, the offshore numbers. Right. Uh, and, of course, that, those offshore numbers uh, have two characteristics. One, that they, as a proportion of GDP, produce a lot less tax uh, than the rest of the GDP. And second, of course, they're going to decline over the long run. So that, if I may say so, is the wrong comparison to do. The interesting when you say they're going to decline, that's assuming the oil price doesn't go up very uh, dramatically. No, it's assuming that um, at some point a finite resource uh, uh, demonstrates that it comes to zero. Right? Uh, oil will run out one day. Yes. Uh, or unless you think perhaps it won't. Well, I think there's more to find under the uh, Atlantic. That's undoubtedly that's true. Question, but yes. do you think it's infinite? Uh, I don't think anyone's Good. suggesting that. Good. But, however, we do have the answer <laughs> to that progress. with renewables. So uh, but we'll not go <laughs> oh, there oh, come, come, come. right just now. <laughs> I mean, one of the things you... Sticking to the social union, you say yep. na national insurance contributions provide a gateway to the welfare system. And yes. I know we've touched on this already. But, I mean, is that not really a bit of an outdated concept? I mean, you used words like stamp which I accept apply maybe to my age group and above, but I don't Thank think you. apply to the 20-year-olds. Perhaps not, but nevertheless, I think the contributory principle is a very important one. It's important for two reasons. Uh, uh, one, because it demonstrates to people that they are buying into uh, a system of um, common and shared risk. And two, uh, because uh, it is, if you like, a fee for membership of the welfare state. I think that's quite important. If you look at the history of the welfare state, uh, if you, in fact, you have a uh, have a look at Beveridge on this. Beveridge is very interesting. In this um, he uh, it sounds a little outdated nowadays, but he was very much against. Uh, he very much wanted to minimise uh, the idea that there was a set of people who were constantly receiving support from general taxation. His aim uh, was that most social security should be funded by this kind of common pooling of resources, a bit like an insurance system, which is why he called it national insurance, or well, George called it national insurance, and also because there is actually a kind of, uh, there's a principal thing there of putting in and taking out. And I actually think that we have uh, lost rather too much of that. And I, I'd rather have more of the contributory principle rather than less. Although you could argue that that is what the whole tax system is, is applied. And, I mean, one mm, of the suggestions no. has been that, I mean, it's always been suggested or for a long time that na tax and national insurance should be, should be put together in the uh, UK level, yes. PAYE and national insurance. Um, I mean, presumably one of the things Scotland could do if we got devolution of both would be actually to put them together, create a simpler system and have a, a lot less cost for admin. Um, I think there's a difference there, uh, if I may say so, between... Um, understanding that there's a single administrative system uh, and understanding the nature of the taxes. The admin system is, in one sense, neither here nor there. It would be, in principle, entirely possible for the UK today to invite HMRC to in, uh, administer the national insurance system uh, in an integrated way with the tax system. That's not the same as saying uh, that you would simply uh, pull the two taxes and have a single tax rate. Going back, I think the contributory principle, which... Uh, is regressive in terms of income, is nevertheless important. So uh, that opportunity exists today, uh, whether, uh, and in fact, if, I, if you accept my argument uh, that when income tax is devolved, there should be a single system of administering it across the UK, those opportunities would still remain. Right, okay. Um, I mean, again, we've, we've touched on benefits a bit and the idea of that I think you suggested that we, Scottish Parliament could supplement benefits. Yes. I mean, two of the key problems uh, we face at the moment are sanctions where we feel, some of us, that uh, people's benefits are stopped for not a good reason and work capability assessments where we feel that some people are assessed as fit for work when we feel they're not. Now, they would not be issues we could deal with with just a supplementary system, would they be? Because that would be changing the fundamental way the DWP works at the moment. Um, I don't actually know the answer to that, Mr. Mason. I haven't studied that. Um, you might be right, but uh, I'd like to, to think about that before I answered it. Yeah, I mean, I, su I suppose my, my fundamental point is, that's right, do we just want to kind of top up the present system or do we really want to change the present system? And a lot of us would like to change it, but... Well, there are many people, of course, who would like to change the present system on a UK level as yes. well. But that is not likely to happen? 
Um, well, I don't know. Um, you, you tell me the result of the next election. OK, fine. <laughs> um, right, just a couple more things, if I may. Uh, we've talked about housing grant as against housing benefit, and I think you talked about how do you support the capital building of the houses or do you pay people the cash yes, to yes. Uh -huh. pay maybe a higher rent and things. Now, at the moment, we're, we are a bit unbalanced in that because we are trying to support the building of the houses. That presumably brings down the housing benefit bill, but that is, is a Westminster thing. So, I mean, would you think that joining the two of them up would make sense? Well, um, I, I'm not sure, quite sure I, I, I share all the premises, but in principle, I think the argument for devolving housing benefit... Um, as opposed to the supplementary system, is that enables you to transfer resources between capital and revenue. That's that's the argument of principle, which is why I have um, suggested the devolution of housing benefit. You get most, but not all, of the uh, upside of this approach uh, by a supplementing system, but not all of it, because you can't, as it were, play those tunes at the edge uh, between capital uh, uh, and, and revenue support. Uh, it's worth remembering... Um, it's very easy uh, in conversations like this to assume that if we just evolve it, there will be more of everything and everything will be better, right? Uh, one of the, the, when the Conservative government moved uh, from supporting housing investment in public sector housing uh, to supporting individuals through um, uh, housing benefit, uh, they saved money by doing so. That's one of the reasons they did it in the 1980s. The housing programme was substantially cut mm -hmm and the housing benefit line went up. But the benefit line didn't go up as much as the programme line went down. So consequently, uh, don't be fooled into thinking that if we simply devolved it, uh, that would make lots more resources available. It won't. It would just enable you to move the resources was, was relatively Was that a, a short-term saving, or was it also a long-term saving? Because presum presumably they saved the capital short-term, but the, they were paying more benefits for quite a long time? Um, well, the, the benefits ran on over time, but yes, um, it was baked into the baseline, as it were, uh, and the uh, Scottish Parliament's budget reflects that ancient historic baseline. Okay. And my final point then would be, going back to minimum wages, where I'm not sure I quite understood uh, the argument that if London had a higher minimum wage, it, it was the thought that uh, a lot of our people would just go to London to, well, to work. Well, uh, my, my objection is, is, is slightly more general than that. I mean, I'm going back perhaps to my argument of economic union. Um, I think there are certain guarantees that you get from being in the United Kingdom, and it seems to me the minimum wage is, is rather a good one of those. And I'm worried about the idea of different regional minimum wages in the UK uh, because of the risk of a race to the bottom. Say it was the other way around, because say there was a desire between, say, Labour and the SNP to put the minimum wage immediately at um, the living wage... Mm -hmm. Wherever that is, where are we? Seventy, seven eighty-five, seven thereabouts. Um, I mean, that that would be the other way around, then, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. But um, I, w one of the tricks in, in designing constitutional systems um, is to make sure that they are proof against any politician who might be in charge, not just the nice ones, the Conservatives. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Steve Gunny. They're going to have the levers of power in Scotland in the foreseeable future. <laughs> um, I was actually going to touch on that, but I think you, yep. you, you both had enough on that at the moment. Um, that, that, that concludes questions for the committee, but I just wonder if I can just touch on sure. one or two wee things mm -hmm. to finish off. When I asked you uh, your view on devolving a number of taxes, capital gains, etc., was one I don't think you did reply to. You talked about inheritance tax, APD. I think maybe just when you were rhyming them off, that was one you didn't really touch on. So just if you can clarify your views um, on which one would evolution you to of on? capital gains tax, um, whether that's something... It, it, as a matter of principle, I think that's possible, Chairman. I, I just wonder if it's worth all the bother. Um, it's a very small yielding tax. I don't have the number at the front of my mind at the moment. It's maybe 100 million, something like that. Mr Brown's obviously looking at 292. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it would be quite a disruptive thing. It, um, capital gains tax, very few people pay. Uh, most people who pay it uh, are, are doing so through you know, smart tax management schemes. Uh, they're doing so essentially because they're using up their capital gains allowance uh, rather than income. Uh, so it's, uh, if you like, uh, a way of minimising income tax by paying out the capital gains. Um, uh, the, I would worry a little bit with the avoidance risk. Um, so I wouldn't rule it as a matter of principle, but I, I just wonder if it's worth the bother, frankly. OK, thank, thank you for that. And just one final sure. point, just about the Scottish rate of income tax. I'm just wondering if you think the annual indexation of the block grant adjustment for the... 
Uh, Scottish rate of income tax uh, should take into account population growth at a UK level relative to Scotland. Okay, um, this is under the Scotland Act 2012. Um, I think things might be different, first of all, if one were to go for a system involving the whole devolution of income tax or the assignment of all income tax proceeds. So, so what I've got to say uh, relates only to the Scotland Act 2012 scheme. And that's quite important, actually, because uh, uh, different considerations apply in different circumstances. It seems to me that under that scheme, uh, there are various uh, risks in the, is what you might call the, the revenue stream to the Scottish Parliament, uh, some of which should be allocated so we're to this Parliament, and some of which should be allocated to the United Kingdom Parliament. Uh, it seems to me that this Parliament should bear the risk primarily of its own taxation decision. In other words, if it cuts the tax, it gets less money. If it increases, it gets more money. Uh, second, uh, 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 and secondly, uh, the easy one, the United Kingdom Parliament uh, should bear the risk of any changes to the structure of the tax base, uh, mm -hmm. so that the UK, if it changes the personal allowance, uh, makes a compensating change to the Barnett Formula Grant, one way or another. So those two are relatively straightforward. The interesting one, uh, the one which you suggest, is about relative growth in the tax base, which might be growth in respect of relative population growth, or it might be growth in respect of income. It doesn't matter what the cause is. My view uh, is that this Parliament should bear the risk of relative growth in the tax base. And of course, um, that's exactly um, uh, what uh, you and some of your colleagues are arguing for, greater fiscal autonomy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's right in principle in this case, certainly in the case of the Scotland Act 2012, uh, because it gives the Scottish Parliament the benefit of the upside of greater growth in the Scottish economy and incentivises it to ensure that that's the case, to use the powers that it's got to do so. So uh, in, in relation to the own resources element under the Scotland Act 2012, uh, this Parliament should uh, bear the risk, uh, the upside and the downside, of relative growth in Scottish income tax compared to English income tax. Otherwise, the thing is not doing what we intended it to do. Indeed, but if the population of England uh, was to grow... Um higher rate than Scotland. I mean, what we've seen recently, as you probably know, a lot of the GDP growth is just, if you look at per capita, there's not really been oh, yes, very much GDP yes. growth. A lot of it is absolutely. just because of increasing population. It's just in that specific issue, uh, you know, would that um, disadvantage Scotland, do you think, if England's population continues to growth, grow in terms of this block grant adjustment relative to well, Scotland? Well, um, depends what that? you mean by disadvantage, Chairman. Obviously, um, I mean, one of the things that's happened over a long period, first of all, is that the population of England has grown more than the population right. of Scotland, so primarily right. from immigration, because uh, right, they've had a lot more immigration than we've had. Um, as a result, I mean, and you're absolutely right to say that when people say that Scotland's growth has lagged behind the rest of the UK and things are bad here, uh, they're talking nonsense. Uh, Scotland's GDP growth has been higher per head than the UK over many, many decades, indeed, since those numbers were calculated in 1963. The population's gone up. Yeah. That's right. Well, the English population's gone up, but the, uh, the GDP per head in Scotland has actually uh, exceeded in growth the GDP per head in England. Uh, so I, mean, I don't think that's a uh, uh, relative population growth is, a, as, is either a problem uh, or, or either a good thing or a bad thing. Um, it's just what it is. Uh, I don't think that we should say, uh, through the income tax system, that because the population of England is growing, they should send us some more money. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, it seems to me uh, that relative population growth in the income tax base uh, is part of the driver of relative population growth in the income tax yield, uh, rel relative growth in the income tax yield, and the Scottish Parliament uh, and its budget should bear that risk relative to England. OK, you made your point clear on that. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank you very much, actually, you. for your very straightforward answers. I mean, we've kept you for 100 minutes, so thank you uh, very much. Just any final points you want to um, make? So it's, it, it, um, thank you, Chairman. It's, it's been good to be here. Mrs. Uh, um, we're in a very, very interesting period, um, uh, as um, Ms. Urquhart and I were saying earlier on. This is um, it's a time of opportunity uh, uh, to create uh, a long-term uh, stable <laughs> Uh, and well-functioning uh, devolution settlement for this Parliament. Uh, we'll do that uh, if and only if we address the questions on their merits. And I hope I've been doing that too, and I hope, I'm sure that the Committee will do that uh, when it reports on this matter. OK, uh, thank you very much. That being the last item on our agenda, I now close uh, the meeting. Thank you.